I spent most of June up in Glacier National Park. Now they call it Crown of the Continent for a reason. Mountains sharp as knives, lakes so clear they mirror the sky, and enough old-growth forests to play hide-and-seek in for a lifetime. The kind of place that makes you feel both big and small at the same time. I'm Arlo, by the way. City dude gone full-time nomad in this here RV. I parked on the west side of the park, found a little dirt track a good five miles from the nearest campground. Place was so overgrown, I bet I was the only one crazy enough to try and drive an RV through it for who knows how long. Finally, it opened up on this perfect clearing right by a stream. It was the kind of spot they write poems about. I spent the next week fishing, hiking, and honestly, just sitting on my RV steps drinking beer and watching the clouds drift by. I didn't see another soul, which is exactly how I like it. But see, something about this spot, well, it felt old. Ancient. Now, I'm not much for woo-woo stuff, but you couldn't deny the air was heavier there, like something had seeped into the soil over a thousand years. The night it started, I was cooking up campfire stew, the good kind that simmers all day and makes your belly happy. Suddenly, this sound echoed through the clearing, like a scream, all high and screechy, but mixed with, I don't know, something like the snort of a bull. It sent chills down my spine. I stepped out of my RV, trying to pinpoint the direction of the scream. I figured it was some kind of animal, maybe a mountain lion with a bad cough. But the sound stopped as soon as it had started, leaving an aching silence. That should have been my cue to pack up, hit the road, and find a Walmart parking lot to post up in for the night. But hey, I ain't known for my smarts. I tossed the rest of the stew in the fridge and crawled into bed. I was nearly asleep when the scratching started. Like nails on metal, slow and rhythmic right outside my RV. It jerked me awake, heart pounding like a rabbit's. I lay perfectly still, trying to tell myself it was just a raccoon or something looking for scraps. But deep down, I knew that wasn't the case. The scratching turned into thumping like something was pacing around the RV. Then silence again. The worst kind. I reached under my pillow, fingers closing around the grip of my hunting knife. The only light I had was the moon shining through the window, casting long, distorted shadows. Then I heard a sniffling sound, wet and snuffling, coming from right outside my bedroom door. I held my breath, trying to make myself as small a target as possible. That's when the creature— Whatever it was, started slamming against my door. The whole RV shook with each slam, the sound so loud I had to clap my hands over my ears. Fear twisted in my gut. It was trying to get in. Suddenly, the slamming stopped. I waited, heart pounding so loud I was sure whatever was outside could hear it. Still, nothing. I dared to glance out the window half thinking it would be gone. It wasn't. Crouched by the RV tire, lit by the moonlight, was the most messed up beast I've ever seen. It was vaguely shaped like a person, but all wrong. Too tall, limbs stretched long and ending in claws that glittered in the darkness. But its head, it looked just like a deer skull, bleached white, with empty sockets where the eyes should have been. It was staring right at me. Its gaze felt so heavy on me that the air crackled. I knew it could see me, even in the shadows. It tilted its skull, letting out that snorting sound again. A test, I wondered, figuring out if I was even worth the effort. That's when I made my decision. Fight or flight, and I ain't much of a runner. I reached under the mattress and pulled out my shotgun. I used to hunt with my old man before he passed. Never thought I'd end up using it to protect myself from whatever this thing was. 
I kicked open the RV door and bolted out, gun raised. It reacted faster than I expected, scrabbling to its feet with an awkward, jerky movement. But I already had it in my sights. I fired. The sound echoed through the trees, deafening in the quiet. It staggered back, and I thought, for a wild second, that I'd actually got it clean. That the damn thing was going to go down, and I could finally breathe. But monsters don't go down that easy. It howled this long, keening sound that made my skin prickle. The sound of the shotgun blast seemed to have driven it into a frenzy. It charged, moving in a blur of bone and antlers. I fired again, and heard a satisfying thud as the shot met its target. But the thing barely flinched. It shook its head, letting loose a spray of blood and whatever else those shotgun shells had blasted out of it. I barely had time to think, what the hell do I do now, before it was barreling towards me again. My feet moved on instinct, the gun falling from numb fingers. I turned and ran for the tree lean, the moonlight and adrenaline-fueled panic blurring together. My only chance was to get to cover, maybe make it circle around and climb a tree, hoping it wasn't the climbing type. It was on me faster than I'd thought, slamming into my back and knocking me to the ground. The air whooshed from my lungs. I tasted dirt and blood. One of its claws pinned my shoulder, and its hot, rotten breath washed over me. I scrambled backwards, trying to kick it away, but the thing was built like a tank. Then I saw it, a busted old branch, lying tangled in the brush a few feet away. I lunged for it, scrabbling desperately. My fingers wrapped around the splintery wood just as the creature pounced. I don't know if it was luck or desperation, or just plain dumb animal instinct, but I shoved the branch upwards as the thing crashed into me. It impaled the creature right through the chest. I heard the crack, felt the impact as bone and flesh gave way. The creature let out a ragged, gurgling sound that didn't sound like anything that should ever come from a living thing. It thrashed, antlers whipping around, but the branch held. The creature was dying, but it wasn't going to make it easy for me. One of its claws raked over my leg leaving a burning trail. Blood poured over my jeans, hot and sticky. I scrambled backwards, my eyes locked on the twitching beast in the moonlight. It stilled. That eerie, snorting breathing ceased. Silence fell on the clearing like a curtain coming down on some morbid play. I must have sat there for an eternity, too terrified to move in case that thing jerked back to life. Finally, the first light of dawn began to filter through the trees. I forced myself up on shaky legs, clutching the bloody piece of wood in one hand. That damn thing was dead. It had to be. I stumbled over to my RV. It looked like a bomb had gone off inside with drawers thrown open fridge ripped apart. Didn't matter. I was getting the hell out of here, creature or not. But I made a detour first. My knees felt like jelly as I approached the creature. Its body lay twisted at an unnatural angle, the branch protruding from its chest like a macabre trophy. The skull had stared up at the trees, those empty sockets seeming to bore into me. I forced myself to meet its gaze. What was this thing? Something from those old Native American stories, I wondered? A bad spirit twisting nature to its own twisted purpose? I didn't know. All I knew was that I had a story to tell. It took the park rangers two days to find me. I was holed up in a gas station a hundred miles away chain drinking coffee and telling a wild story to the cops so baffled they looked half ready to slap me in the psych ward. They didn't fully believe me, of course. Wild animal attack, they said. Maybe some kind of deformed bear? They searched the area, never found a trace of the thing. I didn't tell them I had taken its head. 
That deer skull sits on my RV's dashboard now, a reminder of that night. Every time I drive, I glance at it, and sometimes I swear its eyes gleam back. That was two months ago. I haven't been able to bring myself to drive back into a proper forest since. Cities are safer, I keep telling myself. But every time I close my eyes, I hear that snorting scream echoing in the darkness. I wonder what it was out there. A Wendigo? Some new boogeyman the forests coughed up. Doesn't matter what I call it, doesn't make it any less real. I just know I haven't seen the last of them. And next time, I'll be ready. Okay, so a year ago I finally sold my old place and took my whole life on the road in this fancy RV. Call me cliché or whatever. But after three decades as a nurse stuck in the same town and staring down retirement with nothing to show for it but an empty bank account, well, that fifth will look like the key to freedom. My name's Bryn, by the way. Now, I pick the Pacific Northwest as my new stomping grounds. All that green, those mountains, the mist in the air, I'm a sucker for that stuff, makes you feel a little closer to something. What, I don't know, but something bigger than yourself. May came around, and I found myself deep in one of the thick, old forests Washington State's got to offer. This was no KOE campground. I took my rig down an old logging track so overgrown, if I ever wanted to leave, I'd probably have to do some serious chainsaw work. But man, the spot was idyllic. Perfect little clearing on a babbling creek, surrounded by those giant pines. Didn't see another human soul for a blissful four days. The fifth morning, I was sitting on my RV steps, sipping coffee, and that whole sense of peace shattered. It started with the ravens. Normally, you hear one, too, calling out their harsh call, but this was different. A whole flock of them was circling above the tree lean, their cries sending a chill down my spine. The forest fell deadly quiet. I shrugged it off, told myself it was probably just some unlucky critter getting snacked on, nature doing its thing. But I felt this prickling on my neck, like I wasn't alone. I went inside and made myself busy, figured I'd head into the nearest town in a day or two. Around noon, though, I heard it, the crack of a branch behind the RV. I swung my head around. Nothing. Just the trees and that heavy, empty silence. My heart gave a stupid little thud. Come on, Bryn, I scolded myself, get a grip, you're scaring yourself. I was about to convince myself it was all imagined when I heard something moving near my truck. It was slow and heavy, dragging. Like whatever it was weighed a ton. I peeked out the window. This hulking shape was circling the RV, half obscured by the pines. Dark fur. Or was it matted leaves and moss? Hung in clumps, and it moved on all fours, but somehow unnaturally tall. Its head. I squinted. It looked like a stag skull bleached bone white antlers like bare branches scraping against the trees as it passed. For a wild second, doubt flickered through me. Was this some elaborate prank by board logging folk? A costume? But then it lifted its head and let out a snorting wail that was pure nightmare fuel. No human could make that sound. I was rooted to the spot, a scream bubbling in my throat. It seemed to sense my fear. It turned its skull head towards my window. I swear those empty eye sockets glowed for a second. Panic snapped me out of it. I ran for the RV door, fumbling with the keys. I needed to get the hell out of here, but where was I going to even go on those overgrown roads? The creature was moving quickly now, crashing through the underbrush and slamming into the side of my RV. 
glass shattered. My whole world shook. Then those skeletal antlers were reaching through the window, scrabbling blindly. I snapped out of it, grabbed my shotgun off the kitchen counter, and blasted it point-blank. It staggered back, roaring with a sound that made my teeth ache. Chunks of bloody, something, splattered against the trees. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't going to stop. I stumbled over to the driver's seat, through the RV in gear, and slammed my foot on the gas. There wasn't time to think, just act. The road spat back at me as I bounced along, tree branches whipping at the windows. The RV screeched to a halt. I'd rammed into a pine trunk. The airbag exploded in my face, leaving me dazed. Through the cracked windshield I saw it. The creature was stalking towards me, blood dripping from its ruined face. It looked almost disappointed like it had been robbed of its prize. I didn't wait around to find out if it could tear its way into the wreckage of my RV. I clambered out the back, scrambling until I found a decent trail and bolted for it. I can't tell you how long I ran. Only that eventually I stumbled onto a real road and flagged down a pickup truck. The guys in it were probably half convinced they just picked up an escaped lunatic. The guys listened while I stammered out my wild story, the creature, the wrecked RV, the whole nine yards. One of them, older guy with a beard, nodded like he wasn't fully surprised. Sounds like you ran into a mossy back, he said. They don't like folks in their woods. The other guy just shook his head, muttered something about crazy city women out on their own. But to their credit, they got me back to civilization, called in the cops. Sheriff seemed to humor me long enough to get my statement, then sent me off with a warning about not making up stories to waste his officer's time. Problem was, I couldn't forget it. I couldn't shake the image of that dead-eyed thing, couldn't shake the certainty that it was still out there. I started avoiding those real deep, dark woods. Stuck to crowded campgrounds with screaming kids and other RVers playing bad country music. Safer, I told myself. The nightmares didn't stop, though. It was always chasing me, always gaining, the sound of its hooves a drumbeat in my skull. It got so bad I started researching, digging up old local legends, half-forgotten internet forums. Turns out, the beard dude wasn't too far off. Stories like mine popped up throughout history, all over the Pacific Northwest. Native American tales of shapeshifters stalking the forests, of things that were once men twisted into something wrong. And they all shared one detail, the skull-like head. I couldn't go on like this. The creature, the mossy back, whatever it was, it had marked me. So, I stopped running and started learning. I tracked down old-timers who still knew the half-forgotten ways, poured over grimy handwritten journals and musty historical societies. I learned about the things these beings hate, iron, the scent of certain herbs, the symbols you can carve to ward them off. It took a year. A year of turning myself from a happy-go-lucky retiree into, well, something else entirely. But at the end of it, I had an old rifle etched with protective runes, a leather bag filled with charms, and a burning need for revenge. I had a plan. I found the clearing easily enough. The wreckage of my RV was still there, half dragged into the woods by scavengers. The creature had left its mark, too. Bones were scattered on the ground, small animals and one that might have belonged to a hiker judging by the tattered backpack lying nearby. Fresh bloodstains marked the spot by my RV where I'd shot it. I circled the clearing, laying salt, hanging my herbs, carving the ancient symbols on the trees. When night fell, I built a small fire, laid out my gun, and waited. It came before dawn. The air crackled with wrongness, 
and the flames of my fire flickered in unsettling blue. The creature moved into the light, its antlers catching the moonlight. You remember me, don't you? I said, my voice surprisingly steady. Now it's my turn. The mossy back snarled, and it charged. I was ready, not with fear this time, but with righteous fury. I let it come close, closer, until I could see the putrid, glowing depths of its empty eyes. And then I pulled the trigger. The rune-etched bullet tore through its chest. It stumbled, let out that monstrous, chilling wail, and crashed to the ground. The forest seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. But I wasn't done. I reloaded and stepped over to its twitching body. This is for me, I said, and pumped a second bullet into its skull. This is for the ones you took. It stilled. The glow faded from its eyes, leaving truly empty sockets. The heavy scent of decay filled the air as its form began to warp and melt, turning into nothing more than a pile of moss, bones, and rot. When the sun rose, all that remained of the mossy back was a dark stain on the earth and the lingering smell of something old and dead. I burned the remains, said a few words, the best I could piece together from the fragmented knowledge I'd gathered. Then I walked away, and I didn't look back. Do I regret what I did? Maybe. But I sleep better at night now. There's still fear sometimes, a flicker of doubt that maybe I only imagined the whole thing. But then I see those towering trees, and sense the darkness beyond, and I know. There are things in the deep woods, things most folks would never understand. They took something from me, but I made sure they paid the price. Okay, so a buddy and I, we're big into overlanding and exploring. I swear that guy, Theron, He's got a map of practically every dirt road and campsite in the country. For this trip, we decided to head up to Glacier National Park in Montana. I gotta say, the views alone made the 14-hour drive worth it. Now, both of us ain't big on crowded campgrounds, so we opted for a pretty remote spot a good ways off the main trails. This place, it was nestled right up against some dense pine forest and get this, had a small creek running along the edge of the camp. Talk about picturesque. We arrived right as the sun was starting to dip, so we set a fast pace getting camp ready. You never want to get caught setting up in the dark, at least not in grisly territory. After a quick dinner and some jokes by the fire, we were feeling pretty damn good about our choice of location. The first weird incident happened around three, maybe four in the morning. I woke up to this ungodly howling, just echoing through the trees. I know wolves get a bad rap, but damn, it sounded otherworldly. I nudged Theron, but the dude can sleep through a hurricane. The howling stopped, and I almost convinced myself I dreamt it, but then I heard something else. A rustling just outside the tent at the tree line. My heart started pounding. Now, bears aren't uncommon up there, and I always take precautions with storing food, but I swear this didn't sound like a bear. I heard another noise, like a low growl mixed with a weird chittering sound. My skin prickled. I knew I wasn't just dealing with a curious raccoon here. I carefully unzipped the tent flap a sliver, enough to peek out, and that's when I saw them, eyes. They glowed green in the moonlight, low to the ground, unblinking. Oh man, my blood ran cold. I ain't never seen eyes like that on any animal before. Before I could get a good look at whatever the hell was out there, the eyes vanished. I lay frozen, straining my ears for any hint of movement. For a while, it was just quiet, but then the rustling began again, closer this time, 
circling the tent. I desperately grabbed for my phone, hoping to at least snap a photo, but it was dead. Damn, forgot to top it off last night. Theron finally woke up, groggy and confused. Dude, what's going on? He mumbled. Shut up. I hissed back. There's something out there. I motioned for him to get low and peek through the tent flap. His eyes widened in the darkness. What the hell is that? He mouthed. The creature, I'd call it that now, moved closer. I could make out its silhouette, a flash of fur as it dashed between the trees. It moved with this unnatural speed, its body low and elongated, bigger than a wolf, and way leaner. I think I've got something in the truck, I whispered, remembering my hunting rifle. The tent flap suddenly ripped open. I screamed, catching a glimpse of massive claws and teeth in the opening. The end scrambled to the other side, pulling his knife. The creature lunged forward but got snagged on the tent fabric, ripping a massive hole. I pushed Theron down and fired a shot through the torn canvas. The sound was deafening in the enclosed space, but it sure as hell seemed to startle that thing. I heard it crash away into the trees, snarling and snapping branches. Let's move! I yelled at Theron, already gathering essentials. I wasn't taking any chances, not after that. We hauled ass to the truck, practically stumbling over roots and rocks in the dark. I fumbled with the keys, praying the engine would turn over. It roared to life, and we piled in, slamming the doors shut. I gunned it out of the campsite, the truck bouncing wildly along the narrow path. As we crested a hill, I glanced back, and it was there. Standing on a ridge, illuminated by the moonlight, its eyes reflecting back like emeralds. It moved in that same unnatural way, slinking along on spindly legs, with this weird, elongated back and long, thick tail. Even at a distance, I could make out what looked like clumps of coarse, matted fur across its body. It watched us disappear down the road, and let out a blood-chilling howl that seemed to pierce the entire forest. We drove through the night, never stopping once. Eventually, we found a roadside motel at the crack of dawn, and crashed for a few hours. When I called the ranger the next day, he said they hadn't received any reports of unusual animal sightings around Glacier. He sounded like he thought I was making it up, or had won too many drinks around the campfire. We ended up cutting the road trip short. I don't know what the hell that creature was, but I sure as hell ain't keen on finding out. Locals in the area, they call it the Whisper Shrike, say it's been lurking around those parts for generations, with folks claiming to have sightings throughout the decades. The weird thing is, the descriptions never quite match up, almost like the thing can change its form. I pulled into the campsite late, around one in the morning. After driving all day to get to the Olympic National Forest, I seriously just wanted to crash. My RV is a beast, and don't get me wrong, I love this thing to death, but man, long hauls can be brutal. Stretching my legs out, I cracked the door to see where I ended up. The moon hung low and the campsite was nestled within a valley along the creek. It wasn't the greatest spot, but it was quiet and I didn't see another soul around. Perfect. After today, I needed that isolation. After a quick bathroom break, I climbed into bed. Just as I lay down, I heard a rustling noise outside. My mind jumped to raccoons or maybe even a deer. I mean, this is a freaking forest after all. It's been a while since I've been out like this, but I remember the drill. Don't leave any food or scented stuff out, they're looking for a free meal. 
I drifted off for a few hours but woke up with a start. Definitely heard something this time. Like right outside the RV. Sitting up cautiously, I peeked out a window but didn't see anything at first. Maybe I just spooked myself. I lay back down, only to hear it again. Scraping. Right under my window. Heart pounding, I held my breath and listened. Was something trying to pry the window open? Bears shouldn't be this low, right? I grabbed my phone, ready to blast an air horn app that I installed just in case. The noise shifted to the other side. Maybe it was circling my RV, trying to find, what, exactly? I didn't leave anything out, I'm positive of that. Then I heard the sliding door rumble. Holy hell. A chill ran down my spine. Someone was trying to break in. I fumbled for the air horn app, eyes wide in the darkness, trying to figure out what to do next. The door's handle jiggled. I had it locked, thank God, and then the scratching sound started up again at the back. Think, think, think. I didn't have a ton of options. Start the engine? That'd be freaking loud. Plus it might not even start in the cold. Could I reach my hunting knife from here? I usually keep it tucked under the driver's seat, but honestly, I'm not sure I could even use it if I got it. Then it hit me. I have bear spray. I'd totally forgotten, but hey, desperate times. Crouching low, I inched over to the little cabinet above the stove where I vaguely remembered stashing it. Bingo. With the can in hand, my heart was still pounding in my ears, but I felt slightly less helpless. Holding my breath, I crept toward the sliding door. The scratching had stopped for the moment. I took a deep breath and flung open the door, ready to blast anything that moved. Nothing. Okay, maybe it bolted at the sound of the door, but I doubted it. Whatever was out there felt methodical. I poked my head out, scanning the area with my flashlight. The air was still, the forest silent. There was nothing moving, no animal eyes glowing back at me. Hello? My voice cracked, and I cursed myself for being such a wuss. But the knot of fear in my gut wasn't fading. Shining the flashlight along the tree line, I thought I saw a dark shape slip into the shadows. Was it playing with me? Or was it a trick of the light? Nervously, I checked that both doors were locked and then climbed back into the driver's seat, bear spray still clutched in my hand. Maybe I should try to start the engine, attempt to drive out, even this late. I gripped the steering wheel, staring out into the darkness. Then... A flicker of movement by the back window. Oh God, it was still here. My thumb hovered over the air horn app, ready to blast the crap out of whatever the hell was out there. Suddenly, the scratching sound started again. But this time, right above me, on the roof. I froze. This couldn't be real. It was too big to be an animal. A person making these sounds... No way, they'd have to be massive, and I could have sworn I was alone here. My mind started racing, trying to process what could be up there. Could it jump down? Would the roof even support its weight? I held back a scream, fingers digging into the steering wheel. It stopped. The silence was almost worse than the noise. I waited, the bear spray pointed upwards at my skylight. I listened intently, but heard absolutely nothing. Maybe, just maybe, it had gotten bored or whatever and wandered off. After what felt like forever, I worked up the nerve to slowly turn my head upwards. I half expected some massive, inhuman face to be staring right down at me. Thankfully, the skylight was empty. Cautiously, I crept back to the bed still clutching the bear spray and feeling the adrenaline coursing through me. 
Should I try to sleep? Or just stay awake, on guard all night? Just then, I heard an odd noise. Like something heavy being dragged along the ground somewhere behind my RV. I didn't dare go outside again, but my brain started imagining all sorts of horrors. What the hell was it? And what was it doing? Suddenly, I hear a low, guttural growl. It was definitely close. My pulse quickened, my knuckles turning white on the bear spray. It growled again, this time a bit louder. It was under my RV, crouching to the floor. I peered out the window below my bed. The flashlight beam danced along the tires, and then it caught something. For just a fraction of a second I glimpsed claws, huge black claws unlike anything I've ever seen. Then silence. I lay there on the floor, too terrified to move. What in the hell was that thing? Was it waiting for me to try and make a run for it? Would I be able to outrun it? To make matters worse, I knew my phone had lost service hours ago. Hello? I whisper yelled into the night. Who's out there? If it was some weirdo trying to scare me, I wanted them to know I was on to them. A low rumbling chuckle started, and it was directly under the bedroom. My stomach plummeted. This was no human. It moved around to the front of the RV, sniffing loudly. Holy crap, it could smell me. It growled again, louder this time, raking its claws along the metal underside. My hands were trembling. I had to do something, but what? Suddenly, I remembered the gun in my duffel bag. The gun. I kept it loaded under my clothes, just in case. Not that I enjoy having it, but traveling alone, you never know. I grabbed the bag and pulled out the pistol. My hands shook as I checked the safety off, the cool metal feeling foreign in my grip. Should I wait until it tries to break in again? Or try to fire through the floor and scare it off? My brain felt fuzzy with fear, and I wasn't sure what the smart play was. The growling and scratching continued, now along the side of the RV. It almost sounded playful like a dog with a chew toy. I could hear a sickening tearing sound, as if it was ripping something apart. Oh God, did it find an animal? Another growl echoed from right outside my bedroom window. Whatever this thing was, it knew right where I was. I clutched the gun, my knuckles white. My heart was pounding so furiously I was surprised it didn't hear it, too. I had to do something. This thing wasn't going to leave me alone. My fingers fumbled for my phone. Maybe there was a tiny sliver of reception I could use. No such luck. Still totally dead. I took a steadying breath. I knew if I stayed here, it would just be a matter of time before this thing found a way in. Okay, think, where could I go? Back into the woods? Hell no. There had to be a ranger station somewhere around here. I quickly formulated a plan as best I could in my panic-stricken state. Make a dash for the driver's seat and pray to every god the engine starts. If it does, floor it in reverse and book it out of the campsite, back towards the way I came in. I crept across the bed to the driver's side. Just as I was about to throw the door open, I froze. From the front window, I saw it. Not fully, just its massive silhouette illuminated by the moonlight. It had to be well over six feet tall, maybe seven. Thick limbs. Shaggy, matted fur. And those claws. I could see them clearly now, glinting in the dark, as they tore into the fabric of my awning shredding it to ribbons. This thing was powerful, strong enough to tear my RV apart if it wanted to. Then it stopped moving. The head turned slightly, as if it was sniffing the air. Oh God! It knew I was right here. 
my options evaporated. Going out there was suicide. This thing would rip me apart before I even hit the gas pedal. The scratching at my awning intensified. My breathing came in short, panicked bursts. My fingers tightened on the gun. Maybe I could fire through the windshield. Scare it away, at least long enough for me to get the RV moving. Before I could talk myself out of it, I aimed the pistol, steadied my hand, and fired. The sound was deafening in the enclosed space. The windshield shattered, and I heard a loud, angry roar. I couldn't tell if I'd hit it or not, but it sounded, hurt? The roaring stopped, replaced by a frantic clawing sound coming from outside the shattered windshield. It was trying to climb up onto the hood. In a panic, I fumbled for the RV key, twisting it desperately in the ignition. Please, please, please start. The engine sputtered and whined, but after a few agonizing seconds, it coughed to life. I slammed the gear into reverse. I could hear the creature scramble desperately onto the metal hood, its claws clanging against the roof as the RV lurched backwards. I floored the gas pedal, not caring where I was going, just away from this, this creature. I blindly navigated the dirt road, dodging trees and branches whipping past. My eyes filled with terrified tears, blurring my vision further. I couldn't stop shaking. The creature was still on the roof. I could hear it scrambling and roaring. Suddenly, I saw my salvation, the main highway up ahead. I burst out of the forest, tires squealing as I swerved onto the road. Glancing back, I could still make out its massive form silhouetted against the moon. It watched me disappear into the night, its roars fading into the distance. I drove for hours. I had no clue where to go, just that I couldn't stop. Eventually, I pulled off at some small-town gas station. The sun was already beginning to rise, and I felt the exhaustion wash over me. I went inside, paid for some fuel, and collapsed into the bathroom, sobbing uncontrollably. I never went back to that campsite. The RV is in a storage lot somewhere. I can't bear to even look at it. The police, they thought I was drunk or making it up. No one believed me. But I know what I saw. I know it was out there. And I know that if I hadn't had the gun, well, I wouldn't be here to tell the tale. Locals here call it the Grinshaw. They say it roams the forest these parts, that there's been sightings for years. No one's ever gotten a good look at it. Till now. I remember back in September, maybe three years ago now. My name's Ezekiel and I took a trip out to the Redwood National Parks in California. Huge place, if you've never been, but the trees are something else. The kind of thing that puts you and your whole life into perspective, you know? Makes you feel small, like those trees could outlive ten of you and still be standing. So, naturally, I went alone. Packed up the RV grabbed some supplies, and headed out from Wyoming with no real time frame. It's funny, you know, the reason I ever bought that RV in the first place. Wasn't even for trips like this, really. My ex, she was a bit of a nature enthusiast, thought it would be romantic. We'd go on weekend trips, that sort of thing. She never saw this part of the country, though. We split up right before I got the chance. Life finds a way. Still ended up using the RV anyway, so I guess sometimes things work out. Redwood's a long drive, takes most of a week, even in that gas guzzler with me pushing the pedal. I don't mind, though. Peaceful out on the road. Get to think. Had plenty to think about on that trip, too, what with the messy end of things. But anyway, here's the thing about those parks. 
Big place means lots of roads, and some aren't exactly what you would call maintained. I went in during the dry season, so that wasn't the issue, but some of those forest roads are tight. I almost got the RV wedged a few times making some of the sharper turns. Guess I need to pay better attention to the maps next time. So, it's about day five, and I'm already deep in the thick of it. Not in the really touristy areas, but often like a back section of the park. There's a little campground I found on the map, tucked way off, one of those primitive ones, no running water, hardly any other visitors. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Roughing it, living like a real woodsman or whatever. Now, it's a good couple miles down some winding dirt road to get to this campground, and it's getting seriously dark by the time I near it. I'm just about thinking I might want to pull over somewhere, sleep it off, and try again in the morning when I round the last curve. And hey, there it is. Few picnic tables, fire pits, all that sort of deal. And lucky me, totally empty, not a soul in sight. I'm in business. I park the RV step outside. Man, is it quiet. I mean, there's the usual night critters, crickets chirping, and all that, but this is like silent silent. The trees block out almost all the light, so even though the moon's pretty bright, I'm feeling around, squinting at the signs trying to figure out which way the bathrooms might be. Guess I didn't mention, I'm basically blind at night. Prescription glasses aren't magic, and even my night ones are only good for so much. So I'm poking around, flashlight in hand, getting my bearings when I hear it. Sort of a scratching sound. High up, like way, way up. I sweep the flashlight beam overhead, searching the branches. The redwoods are so massive, it's hard to make anything out in the tangle of wood and leaves. Whatever made the noise, it stopped now. Shrug it off, figure it was an owl or something. Start looking for the trail again, when I swear I see a flash of movement from the corner of my eye. This time, it's way closer, down low by the tree lean. I whip the flashlight over, but nothing's there. My heart's starting to pound a little, you know? Middle of nowhere, nobody around for miles, weird noises. It's enough to get a guy's head buzzing. Just the dark playing tricks. I tell myself, even though I doubt it. I keep the flashlight on now, sweeping back and forth, but can't find the source of the movement. I decide I've had enough. Whatever's lurking in the bushes can wait. Gotta take a leap before I crash, and maybe a drink or two wouldn't hurt to calm the nerves. Head back to the RV, try to shake off the jitters. I flip the lights on as I climb in, and that's when I see it. Mud streaks, big ones, all across the side door. Like something big had brushed against it. Definitely human-sized, if not bigger. My blood runs cold. I look around the interior. Everything seems in place. I don't hear anything outside. Whatever it was, it's moved on, I think. Still... That doesn't make me feel any better. I decide maybe I'm being paranoid. Probably just some deer got startled by me driving in. After all, what else could it be, right? Still, I lock all the doors, grab my rifle, more for reassurance than anything else. I settle down in the driver's seat, try to forget the whole creepy encounter. Tomorrow, I think... Tomorrow I'll pack up and head deeper into the park, find a more populated campsite. No use staying out here when I'm all freaked out. I'm just starting to doze off when it starts. A knocking, loud and hard on the metal door of the RV. Each rap echoes through the whole thing, makes me jump practically out of my skin. I grab the rifle, hands shaking, and creep over to the front. I peer out the windshield, heart thumping like a jackhammer. Nobody there. 
well, at least not in the light. The flashlight strapped to the rifle illuminates a good stretch of ground, but nothing breaks the shadows of the trees. That knock didn't sound human, though. Too hard, too deep-sounding. Like a fist-pounding steel. I stand there, on edge, for what feels like hours. Finally, nothing else happens. I start to think I must have imagined it. Maybe some branch fell, or maybe the RV settled on a rock. But even as I think that, a part of me knows it's a lie. I debate just driving off right then and there. Screw finding another campsite I can head out. Find some motel on the main road and get the hell out of Dodge. But it's what, three in the morning by now? It would be a pain in the ass driving this thing in the dark on those narrow roads. Plus, I'm exhausted. Against my better judgment, I slide back into the driver's seat and barricade myself in. I lock the doors, draw the curtains, dim the lights down as low as they'll go. Eventually, I drift off into an uneasy sleep, rifle nestled in my arms. The rest of the next day is rough. All I can think about is the night before, and every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig sends me jumping. I try to hike the trails, try to admire the views, try to get my mind off things, but it's a no-go. My senses are on high alert. I'm convinced I see things every time I turn my head. By nightfall, I'm back at the RV, curled up in a ball and practically vibrating with terror. I know it's not rational, but I can't shake the feeling that something's out there watching me. And then comes the worst part I realize I've lost my phone. It must have slipped out of my pocket on the hike. No reception out here anyway, but having a lifeline, even a dead one, would make me feel less alone. It's getting dark too quickly, and I scramble around the RV like a madman. I have to get inside, have to hide. Flashlight strapped to my rifle, I flick it on, sweeping around in the falling darkness. That's when I see them. Eyes. Two huge, glowing eyes staring at me from the darkness. They're too high up to be anything normal, gotta be at least eight feet off the ground. Whatever they belong to is huge, and it's close. The eyes move slowly, deliberately, fixated on me. I can tell it's sizing me up, deciding what to do. I'm frozen. Every instinct is screaming at me to run, to get back in the RV, but I can't move a muscle. I don't even lower the flashlight, even though I know it makes me an easy target. Part of me is just curious, morbidly curious. Gotta see what's been stalking me. The eyes bob a little, and then I see it. The creature emerges from the darkness. I can only make out the silhouette at first, but it's huge. Massive shoulders, long limbs that seem too bendy, too long. The thing steps closer, and I catch more details. It's hunched over, but it still towers over me. The skin looks pale, gray in the moonlight, and smooth, almost hairless. The head is the strangest part. Small, misshapen, with a jaw that juts forward, ending in a long, pointed snout. Huge teeth like crooked spikes line its gaping maw. I stumble back, the flashlight slipping from my grasp. I almost lose it in the dark, but manage to snatch it up again with shaking hands. Panic kicks in full force then. Don't know how I didn't scream, but somehow I managed to turn and run back towards the RV. I'm almost there, already reaching for the door handle, when I hear a new sound. A low, wet snarl. I look back. The creature's coming up behind me, way too fast. It's on all fours now, and it moves with this horrible, jerky motion that makes my stomach turn. My hand goes for the door handle, yanks it locked. My heart freezes. In my scramble to get away, I forgot I'd locked the damn thing the night before. 
I hear the creature behind me growling, a sound from out of my worst nightmares. No time to fumble with keys something in me just snaps. I whirl around, level the rifle, and fire. The boom of the gunshot echoes into the night, feels way too loud in the close quarters of the trees. The creature jerks, lets out a shriek that's like nails on a chalkboard, and stumbles back a few steps. I don't even hesitate, hit the ground, rolling, and come up beside the driver's door. Rip the keys out, jam them in the lock with trembling hands, and fling the door open. Inside. Slam the door. Hit the locks. Fall back in the seat, shaking so hard I can barely breathe. I glance at the side mirror. The creature is back up, but it's holding a forelimb now, dripping blood. I got it, at least a little. I try to start the RV, but the engine just coughs and dies. I pump the gas, try again, nothing. Frantic, I glance around in the dim interior. There's gotta be something here, then I see it. A metal bat, tucked in a side compartment. I bought it on a whim, figuring it wasn't a bad idea for a solo traveler. Never expected to use it, certainly not like this. The creature starts bashing at the side window. Huge claws rake the glass, leaving behind deep cracks. It snarls, the grotesque head pressed right up against the glass, teeth gnashing with rage. I know that won't last long. No other choice. Do or die time. I grab the bat, unlatch the door, and barrel out, screaming at the top of my lungs. I don't know what I'm planning to do, exactly. Maybe scare it off. Buy myself time? I'm swinging like a man man, more out of desperation than anything else. The creature recoils, taken aback, then hisses and lunges. I dodge, slam the bat against its side with all my strength. It screeches like a wounded animal, stumbles back again, but I can tell I'm hitting the end of my luck. Things tough, and it's pissed now. I dart around the back of the RV, trying to remember where I saw that trail earlier. It's all I can hope for, a way out of here. I glance back over my shoulder, the creature's limping after me, but it's slower. My arm's on fire from swinging that bat, and I'm already running out of steam. Then I see it, a trail marker. Yes. I sprint towards it, the creature trailing me relentlessly. I reach it, take the turn, and run, barely even registering the terrain ahead of me. The creature growls right behind me, claws raking the bark of trees as it squeezes between them. I don't dare look back. Just run. Finally up ahead, I see a different light. Not moonlight, but the warm glow of campfires, or maybe car lights. I burst out of the trees, into the clearing, and there they are. Park rangers, setting up an emergency checkpoint, their faces full of alarm. Over there! I managed to gasp, pointing back the way I came. Creature, forest, attacked me. My legs give out then, and I crash to the ground. The last thing I see before I black out is the rangers running, guns raised, straight into the trees. I woke up two days later in a hospital bed. Turns out, those muddy streaks outside my RV weren't a deer but a guy who'd gone missing on the hiking trails. The rangers followed the trail of blood, found the body, and that creature. Dead. Turns out, my shot hit something vital, and all that running wore it down enough for the rangers to finish it off. I tell them my story over and over, and none of them really believe me. They don't find any other creature tracks. No evidence supporting the tale I tell of some grotesque beast from my nightmares. They chalk it up to stress, hallucinations brought on by my encounter with the body, being alone out in the woods. Whatever. I don't really care what they think. 
I'm just glad it's over. Glad it's dead. I named the creature, as least in my own head. The night crawler, for how it hunted and lurked in the shadows. It almost got me, but it lost. They put up warnings and signs all around those campgrounds, new protocols in place for missing hikers. Some take it seriously, but most laugh it off, say it's just some weird story from a rattled camper. Me, I pack up, sell the RV, and head home. Guess I'm not the woodsman type after all. I remember back in September, buddies and I decided to take an end-of-summer RV trip up into the Pacific Northwest. You know, real cliché stuff. Me, being the organized type, got the whole thing mapped out. Campgrounds, hiking trails, diners with that classic small-town greasy spoon charm. Heck, Corby even brought his fancy camera. Figured he'd try taking those artsy nature shots for his photography class or whatever. Point is, we were stoked about it. Now, I'm not superstitious, but I swear, things felt a bit off from the get-go. Driving north out of Portland into Washington, we passed by this tiny town. I don't recall the name, kind of faded on the road sign. But everyone in the RV got quiet at the same time. The place was empty. Not abandoned, more like everyone had just vanished. No cars, shops all shuttered, doors wide open with stuff still half out on the sidewalk. We tried to laugh it off, like some weird ghost town gag, but it was unsettling. Our first night, we camped in Gifford Pinchot National Forest. Absolutely gorgeous, but isolated. And something moved out there in the dark. I mean, animals are expected, but these were big rustles, heavy footsteps. Corby thought it was hilarious, called out this hole. Bigfoot, is that you? Spiel. I told him to shut it, trying to hear better. It sounded like something was circling our camp. Next morning, we found big footprints, looked almost human, but way too big messed up toes and stuff. We decided to head out quickly after that. That afternoon, we found a cool spot to pull the RV over, a little lake with a view of empty atoms. We were goofing around, trying to skip rocks, when I saw something in the woods on the far side of the lake. At first, I couldn't make it out, but then it moved and... Jesus! It was like nothing I'd ever seen. Tall, lean, but hunched over. Grayish-brown skin, long arms that almost went to its knees. And its head, massive forehead, flat face, eyes completely black. Corby yelled, I think even he realized this wasn't a joke anymore. I was just frozen. This thing. It watched us for a moment, then melted back into the trees. We bolted. Didn't stop running till we hit the RV. I slammed it into gear, and we didn't look back until we were miles down the highway. I didn't see it again on that trip, but I knew, we knew, it was still out there. Corby stopped taking photos, and no one even tried to crack a Bigfoot joke the rest of the way home. We didn't tell anyone, not for a long time. People think you're crazy or lying when you describe something like that. But sometimes, like now, telling the story, well, I hear those heavy footsteps again in the woods at night. Or maybe it's just my imagination playing tricks. Maybe. But here's the thing, we were digging through an old box of stuff from that trip a few months ago, and Corby had this folder of pictures he'd never shown us. Printed blurry and out of focus, but in one of them. I swear, behind the trees by that lake, you can just make out the silhouette of that thing. Watching. Corby, though, he's changed after the trip. Quiet, you know? Like there's a weight on him. Sometimes he disappears for a few days. 
I try to ask him where he's been, but he just shrugs, says he needed to clear his head. Last week, I saw his car packed up, camping gear and all. I watched him drive out of town, headed north. He wasn't coming back. I knew it. I tried to stop him, but something inside me held back. After all, maybe if he finds that thing again, gets clearer pictures or something, maybe then people would believe us. Maybe he could finally let go of whatever's eating away at him. I don't know. I didn't know a lot of things before that trip. I've got my dad's old hunting rifle. Loaded. I don't plan on going up to those woods looking for anything, but out here on my porch at night, the forest stretching dark and endless behind my place, well, sometimes those heavy footsteps feel a little too close, and I think it's better to be prepared. Just in case. I woke up at 3 a.m. like always when I'm out here. You get into a rhythm with this RV thing, even with the blackout curtains. Especially out in the boonas like this. The first thing I do is go to the bathroom. Always have to pee in the middle of the night. Then I get up and make coffee and eat a small breakfast because my stomach doesn't like a lot of food in the a.m. I always work out, so that's a good hour of my day gone. The next couple of hours, I get work done. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. How do I get an internet connection way out here? It's amazing what a good cell signal booster will do in the 21st century. And hey, it's not like I get a lot of visitors to distract me. I mean, that's part of the whole point of coming out here, right? I bought this RV after my divorce. The wife and kids hated camping. They always wanted to stay in some fancy hotel, but that's not really my style. So, this beast of an RV was my compromise. Still got the comforts of home, but also the ability to get away, be somewhere beautiful, and not hear another human voice for weeks on end if I don't want to. Today, my spot is somewhere in Pisgah National Forest. Don't ask me for the exact coordinates, though. A guy's gotta keep a few secrets. So, after a few hours of work, it's starting to get towards the middle of the afternoon. Time for me, Owen Wexler by the way, to stretch my legs. I grab the backpack and stick the essentials in there, multi-tool, water bottle, lighter, that little med kit with the good painkillers. That kind of stuff. This being bear country. I put my point three five seven on my hip. You ever see videos of those grizzlies charging people? Yeah, bear spray ain't gonna cut it for me. I hike this trail I found near my spot fairly regularly. It's nice enough, you know, trees, a little stream, and a good view if you make the climb to the top. Today, though, something seems off. Can't quite put my finger on it. It's one of those feelings that starts in the back of your neck and slowly crawls down your spine, like someone you can't see is touching you. The birds are eerily quiet, but then again, afternoons can be like that out here. I reach a spot halfway into the hike where it forks, heading down a slightly overgrown path with a lot of rhododendron bushes. I take a deep breath and shake it off. I'm probably just imagining things. Then I hear it. A snap. Like a heavy branch breaking but coming from further down the overgrown trail. My hand goes to the sidearm. Now those neck hairs are really standing up. I swear this is why people buy those big attack dogs. To have a buddy when stuff gets creepy in the woods. Another snap, this time closer. That's it. It's time to bounce. But as I'm turning back, something catches my eye. It's just a flicker of movement in the rhododendrons. But there's something big behind those thick leaves. I draw my pistol, but I'm not exactly Rambo out here. I hold it in front of me with shaking hands. 
This is ridiculous. It's probably just a deer or something. I try to relax and slowly start walking backwards, keeping my eyes peeled for whatever it is. Suddenly, this huge, dark shape lunges out of the bushes. My mind barely has time to register it, like a mix between a bear and a damn gorilla. I've never seen anything like it. It's taller than me by half, with these ridiculously long arms and thick, dark fur matted with twigs and something that might be dried blood. My instincts take over and I fire two shots, but they seem to have zero effect. Maybe it's too far, maybe my aim sucks under pressure, who knows. Whatever it is, the gunfire only seems to piss this thing off. It lets out a roar, way more guttural than a bear's. Then it's charging right at me. Now I'm not Usain Bolt, but let me tell you, fear does wonders for your adrenaline. I spin around and bolt up the main path, half tripping over rocks and roots. I can hear it behind me, heavy footfalls, that horrifying roar echoing through the trees. A few minutes must have passed, an eternity when you think you're gonna die. I glance back and see it starting to slow down, like it knows it's got me beat. Ahead I hear something different. Crashing water. Oh man, it's the stream. I forgot the trail runs a bit too close to it, and I've got nowhere to run. I've heard stories, though. Bears aren't the best swimmers. Maybe it'll be the same for Gorilla Bear Demon here. With zero time to strategize, I plunge down a short embankment and hit the water with a splash. The current's fast, yanking me along. I'm gasping for air, half from the cold water and half from the panic. The roar grows more distant. Wait, did that work? Maybe I lost it. Then, my legs slam into something hard. A rock. My body slams into it, a sickening crack filling the air. My vision blurs, and my body jerks in pain. I hear a triumphant roar from upstream as blackness takes me. I'm not sure how long I'm out. Could be minutes, could be hours. It's hard to tell with the twilight starting to fade into the trees. The first thing I feel is the pain. Holy hell, my ribs ache like they're on fire. Probably cracked or even broken. My legs are a whole other story. The left one definitely isn't bending the way it's supposed to. The current seems to have gentled now, the water's shallower. I try to pull myself up using my arms, but only get a few inches before a wave of nausea hits me. Ugh, this is bad. I groan out loud. Well, if you've officially made a mess of things. There's nobody out here for miles. That thing is probably still around, and your body's mangled. But hey, at least you had one hell of a story, right? I almost laugh at the absurdity of it, but the pain is, well, it's distracting. Taking some deep, shaky breaths, I try to think. Okay. Gotta get out of this water. Gotta find something to use as a crutch. Maybe signal someone somehow? One problem at a time, Wexler. One problem at a time. Suddenly, my ears perk up. I thought I was alone, but I hear the distinct sound of snapping twigs, moving closer. No, no, no. This can't be happening. My mind races. It's got to be that creature coming back to finish the job. I try desperately to roll over, get a decent fighting stance, anything, but the pain is too severe. A whimper escapes my lips. Is this how it ends? Taken down by a monster in the middle of nowhere? Then I see it. Two beady eyes reflecting the fading light. But they're the wrong height. It's not that tall, not the monster. A wave of relief washes over me, followed by a healthy dose of fear. Because the eyes belong to a coyote, and I'm on its dinner menu. I see the coyote circling, getting closer. My hand reaches for the pistol, but my leg throbs with pain. 
It's useless. This is hopeless. And I can't help but laugh a little hysterically. My dad always said I'd die doing something dumb. Guess being bear monster bait in the middle of nowhere counts. Then it hits me. Fire. The lighter is in my backpack. It's soaked and my fingers are shaking, but I have to try. Digging with my one good arm, I manage to pull it out. Please, please let this work. I strike it once, twice, three times, finally a tiny flicker of a flame. Frantically, I tear bits of my waterproof jacket and gather whatever dry debris I can find within reach. I arrange the makeshift tinder pile in front of me, a pathetic little barrier. The coyotes stopped, watching me with those hungry eyes. I see other shapes emerge from the shadows. A whole pack. I light the fire just as the first one lunges. The flames scare it back for a second, and I take the opportunity to skim my surroundings. There's a thick tree trunk within reach, gnarled and covered in moss. Maybe, just maybe. I focus on controlling my breathing, trying to ignore the excruciating pain as I army crawl towards the tree. The pack is snarling and circling, but they haven't breached the fire yet. I reach the trunk and grab a low branch, somehow managing to pull myself into a sitting position, leaning against it. I need a plan. Then it hits me. My multi-tool is still hooked on my belt. With trembling hands, I unbuckle it and flick the pliers open. They're not exactly wolverine claws, but it's the best I've got. I grip the pliers tightly in one hand. Okay, Wexler, it's now or never. I take a deep breath and yell at the top of my lungs. It's a primal scream full of fear and adrenaline. The coyotes scatter momentarily, surprised by the noise. Using this opportunity, I hobble a few steps away from the tree, closer to the center of the small clearing where my little campfire is sputtering. My injured leg drags behind me uselessly, but I clench my teeth against the pain and keep going. Crouching with my crude weapons raised, I yell again. It's a ridiculous sight, I know. Me, broken and bloody, waving a pair of pliers, shouting at a bunch of coyotes. But it's working. The coyotes are hesitant, circling me warily in the fading light. I'm running out of time, though. The fire's dying down. I know they're gonna pounce soon. It's then I realize there's no more noise from upstream. Did, did I actually scare off the bear monster? Or is it circling too, waiting for its chance? I take a gamble, spinning around to skin the darkness, ready to scream, ready to fight. But the woods are silent. Hours seem to pass as I remain hunched waiting for an attack that never comes. The fire finally dies. I'm swallowed by darkness, shivering from the cold, and the shock starting to set in. My grip on the pliers loosens. Did I make it? Or is this just some cruel pause before the inevitable? Hello? Is anyone out there? My head snaps up, hope flaring. That voice, it sounds human. Could someone have heard me? Hello? I call back, my voice hoarse. Please, I need help. Footsteps approach, rustling the leaves, and then the beam of a flashlight cuts through the dark. Two figures. A man and a woman. Park rangers, from the look of their uniforms. I almost collapse with relief. My God, what happened to you? The woman gasps, kneeling beside me. My story spills out in a jumbled mess, about the creature, the coyote, the injuries. They listen intently, shining lights on my leg and ribs. The man speaks into a handheld radio, calling it in. An ambulance is on the way. I'm going to make it. The aftermath is chaotic. Days spent in the hospital, surgeries and a barrage of questions from police and park officials. 
Nobody really believes my bear monster story. The official report chalks it up to a bear attack, a common enough occurrence in these parts. I can't exactly prove them wrong. They find my RV, my hiking pack, but no sign of the creature. The search is eventually called off. Sometimes, out in the wilderness, nature dishes out a dose of the truly unexplainable. My scars, both physical and mental, will take longer to heal. But hey, at least I have a hell of a story to tell at the bar. And yeah, I know it's something big, something dangerous still lurking out in those woods. From now on, I stick to the campgrounds where the most ferocious creatures are the ones stealing your marshmallows. But every now and then, lying awake at night, I hear that roar in my head. And I wonder, do the legends of the skinwalker lurk somewhere in these Appalachian hills? I guess we'll never know for sure. It was my thirtieth birthday, and I was hellbent on getting out of the city for once. See, I'm Ezra, and I work in tech, which means ninety percent of my life is spent staring at screens and dealing with, let's just say, interesting clients. So, I booked us an RV getaway to some remote patch of woods in New Mexico. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not usually the outdoorsy type. But my girlfriend, Lila, she loves this stuff campfires, hiking, the whole nine yards. So, here I was, trying to be this supportive boyfriend, and prove that I could handle a bit of roughing it in the name of love. Or, well, something like love. We found this trailhead nestled way off the beaten path, barely a parking lot, really. Figured it'd be perfect, right? Away from the crowds just us and nature. But even as we're gearing up, Lila's already frowning, flipping through some brochures she printed out. Ezra, are you sure about this? She says, squinting at the map. These trails aren't even marked. Hey, isn't that the whole point? Adventure? I try to laugh it off. Fact is, I half-assed the research on this one. But Lila, bless her, She's always prepared. She starts rattling off safety tips, making me check my pack for the hundredth time. I mean, we've got a first aid kit, a compass, and those emergency bear whistles that, let's be real, we probably just used to annoy each other with. Anyway, we finally set off, me feeling that familiar mix of anxiety and excitement that comes with any major trip. The hike starts off easy enough. It's mostly pine trees, sunbeams slicing through, all very picturesque. Lila takes a million photos, and I can't help but grin, even with this ridiculous pack weighing me down. I'm starting to get a tiny bit cocky. Maybe this nature thing isn't so bad after all? That's about when we lose the trail. Or rather, it just sort of peters out. No big deal, right? We figure we'll backtrack a bit. Only, now it seems like nothing looks familiar. We spend maybe an hour bushwhacking, me cursing under my breath, Lila looking more and more tense. Well, I finally huff, plopping down on a fallen log. Guess we should just find a good spot for tonight, hunker down. Lila gives me a long look. Ezra! We don't have enough supplies to camp out here. Not unplanned? I sigh, running a hand through my hair. This was definitely not part of the romantic getaway vision I'd sold her on. Just as I'm about to suggest we turn back again, there's a crack in the distance. A branch snapping, way too heavy for a squirrel or something. Hear that? Lila whispers, her eyes wide. We freeze, listening. The forest around us is eerily still. Then, a low growl echoes through the trees. My blood runs cold. Bears? Mountain lions? I don't know my predator sounds, 
and honestly, I don't want to find out. Come on, I hiss, tugging Lila's arm. That's when we see it. A flash of movement between the trees, a lean, massive shape slinking out of sight. It's far enough away that we can't make out details, but whatever it was, it was big. Way too big. Run! I shout, and we take off, scrambling through the undergrowth. My heart's pounding in my ears, and Lila's not far behind, both of us ignoring the way branches whip our faces. We burst out onto a dirt track, no signs of the creature, nothing but dense forests all around. Are, are we okay? I gasp, trying to catch my breath. Lila just shakes her head, her face is ashen. I don't know, she whispers. We need to find a road, somewhere people might be. We start following the track, no idea if it's leading anywhere useful. But the sun's already starting its descent, and the shadows are getting long and creepy. I keep glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see that thing emerge from the trees. Lila's got her bare whistle clutched in her fist, a futile weapon against whatever was back there. It's almost dark when we finally come across a cabin. Small rundown, but it's shelter, and that's all we care about right now. I try the door handle, locked, of course. My shoulder hurts, but desperate times, right? I heave, slamming into the wood once, twice, and that flimsy thing finally gives way with a splintering crash. We stumble inside, slamming the door shut behind us. The cabin's musty, full of dust and cobwebs, but the windows are boarded up, the roof seems solid. It'll do. Better check for a phone, Lila mutters, already rummaging through drawers. I slump down onto what must have once been a couch. As my eyes adjust, I notice something strange carved into the wall. Crude drawings, kind of like stick figures, but with way too many limbs, all twisted and wrong. And underneath, a single word, scratched deep into the wood watcher. A chill runs down my spine. Hey, Lila. I call, my voice barely above a whisper. Come look at this. But she doesn't answer. I glance around, a knot forming in my stomach. The cabin's tiny, one main room, a dingy kitchen off to the side. She's not here. Lila? I try again, louder, fear edging into my voice. I'm about to check outside when I hear it. A thump at the window, and then a scratching sound, like claws against the boards. I creep towards the window, heart pounding. All I can see is darkness pressed up against the boarded-up glass. For a long, terrible moment, nothing happens. And then, a single eye blinks open in the blackness. Not yellow or red like the scary stories, just a dull, cloudy white but massive and inhuman. A strangled gasp escapes me, and I stumble backward, tripping over a loose floorboard. The eye vanishes, and I'm left in a tomb-like silence, broken only by my ragged breaths. That's when I hear Lila. Not from outside, no, from downstairs. I'd completely forgotten about the damn root cellar this old cabin has. I almost call out to her, but the memory of that eye, those scratches, stops me. Whatever's out there, it got to Lila, and I'm next. Panic surges through me, and I know I've got two choices, hide or run. My brain tells me the window, the trees, even if whatever that thing is catches me, maybe there's a chance out there. But another, colder part of me, the part that's been paying attention to all those true crime podcasts lately, says a lock cellar with an unknown creature on the loose is a death trap. Decision made. I find the latch, swing the cellar door open, and plunge into the musty darkness below. It's even worse than upstairs, pitch black, full of ancient tools and spiderwebs. 
I fumble around for something, anything, that might work as a weapon. My fingers close around a rusty axe handle. It'll have to do. I crouch down beside a pile of rotting lumber, the axe clutched in sweaty hands. Minutes crawl by. I hear noises, scurling footsteps, soft thumps, but whatever it is, it doesn't come down. I start to think maybe I've outsmarted it, that its intelligence is animalistic rather than, well, whatever else it could be. That's about when the screaming starts. Lila's voice, piercing the silence, full of terror. Something heavy slams above me, a wet, sickening thud, and then her screams cut off abruptly. My grip tightens on the axe, and a scream of my own starts to claw its way up my throat. Then I realize something, the distraction. Of course. It was playing with us, this whole time. And it wants me to come upstairs. I weigh my options, but the truth is, there aren't any. I can't stay down here forever, and up there. At least up there I might have a chance to run, to find help. Or, even more terrifying, a chance to find out what the hell this thing is. With a final, ragged breath, I burst from the cellar and scramble up the stairs, the axe raised. The cabin's main room is empty, bathed in the sickly yellow light from the moon. Then I notice the blood. Smears of it, all over the floor, leading towards the shattered remains of the front door. I charge outside, the axe forgotten, following that crimson trail. It winds through the trees, almost like it's leaving clues on purpose, and ends at a clearing a few hundred meters away. And there, under the cold moonlight, is Lila. Her body, at least. I don't even want to think about describing. I just drop to my knees and scream until my throat is raw. It's not until much later, when the first rays of dawn start to paint the sky, that I notice something else in the clearing. Footprints, enormous prints, unlike anything I've ever seen, with too many misshapen toes. And they don't lead away. They just kind of stop. Like whatever made them just vanished into thin air. I stumble back to the road, somehow manage to find a trucker who gives me a ride into town. Police, statements, search parties, it's all a blur. The authorities don't find any clues, no sign of the creature. Lila's death gets chalked up to a rogue bear or a mountain lion, maybe. But I know what I saw. I know what's out there. The aftermath? Well, let's just say it's not good. I drop out of work, my apartment, just let it all rot for a while. I end up at a dive bar in some nowhere town, trying to drink away the visions of that thing's cloudy eye, the memory of Lila's screams. One night, a grizzled old guy sidles up to the bar, downs his shot, and says, Sounds like you met the high behind. Honestly, I think he's just another drunk, but something in his tone piques my interest. Turns out, this guy's spent his life gathering local lore, weird stories, and he swears the hide-behind's a real thing, preying on those who wander into the deep woods. He says they're stalkers, drawn to fear. They get off on dragging out the hunt, the terror. And yeah, maybe it's crazy talk, but after all that, crazy doesn't seem so outlandish. The old man even gives me a scrap of paper— supposedly instructions on how to ward one off. Honestly, I don't even care if it works. It gives me a purpose, something to do instead of just waiting for my nightmares to catch up. So here I am now, back on the road. Not the RV trip I envisioned, but a different kind of adventure, I guess. Tracking down backcountry trails, isolated cabins, the places where people have gone missing under mysterious circumstances. Maybe I'll learn how to fight this thing. Maybe I'll get myself killed in the process. Either way, I'm not gonna sit around and let it happen to anyone else, not if I can help it.
I pulled into the campsite late, close to midnight. One of those spontaneous trips, you know? The whole week felt like a pile of crap that needed burning, and honestly, there's nothing like a fire under the stars to make that happen. It was June, so my plan was to leave the windows open, let the soft summer night flow in. The reality of a Louisiana summer is a bit different. Still, I found this little gem of a spot, tucked away along the Sabine River, and figured it'd do. My buddy Rhett would have teased me about staying somewhere so established. He was the roughing it type. Hell, he probably would have just slept in his battered old truck, mosquitoes and all. But hey, I like my RV. Glamping is in style these days, yeah? Anyway, I got out, stretched, the usual routine. Unhitched, got the legs down, hooked up the electricity, and popped a beer to survey the situation. Now, this spot was a bit unusual. Instead of those neatly arranged, pull-through, sites most RV parks have, it was more of a clearing with a ring of fire pits and picnic tables around it. Reminded me of summer camp as a kid, honestly. There were trees all around, thick enough that it felt private. It was pitch black with just the faintest outline of the river down the path. Peaceful as hell. Just as I thought. Man, this is gonna be something special. Headlights cut through the trees. Another RV pulled up and circled the clearing, probably figuring out where to park. I raised my beer in a friendly sort of wave and watched them settle a few spaces away from me. It was an older couple, Beatrice and Elmer, from the looks of it. They didn't come out right away. Looked like they were having a late dinner. Since I was kind of beat and honestly a bit too relaxed after that first beer, I figured I'd keep things simple. Beans in the microwave, a crappy movie queued up. It was while I was rummaging around in the mini-fridge that I heard it. A low growl. I froze. My first thought was one of those big feral hogs Louisiana has a problem with. They can be mean and they love digging through trash. I peered through the side window at Beatrice and Elmer's RV, but they had all their shades drawn. The growling came again, closer this time. My blood ran cold. It wasn't a hog. It was deep, guttural, like nothing I'd heard before. I'm not ashamed to admit my hands were shaking, but I grabbed my phone and edged toward the front window. What I saw nearly made me drop the damn thing. There, at the edge of the clearing, hunched beneath a huge oak tree, was a shape I couldn't make sense of. I ain't talking no deer or bear, nothing like that. This thing, it was huge for one thing. Like, taller than Elmer Easy and bulky. Its skin I used that word loosely, looked tough as old leather, dark gray, with patches of scraggly hair. But what stuck with me... What made my stomach clench were the legs. They were all wrong. Longer than they should be, jointed backwards like some kind of damn bird. It stood hunched over, its head low. At first, I couldn't make out a face, just a shadowy lump. Then it shifted, slowly, and I swear, I caught a glimpse of eyes too close together, gleaming in the reflected light from Elmer's RV. I fumbled backward, almost tripping over one of those fancy camping chairs I never use. My mind was screaming all sorts of nonsense. Demon. Escaped experiment. Straight up monster. All I knew for damn sure was I wasn't gonna go out there for a closer look. I locked every door, turned up the dumb movie so loud it drowned out my own ragged breathing, and hunkered down, phone in hand whispering a prayer I hadn't bothered with in years. I must have drifted off at some point, cause the next thing I knew, I was jerking awake to the sound of scratching on the side of the RV. My blood ran cold, and for a long moment I couldn't move. Then, the creature let out a snarl like a chainsaw right outside my window. 
I swear, the RV shook with it. Oh God, oh God, I muttered, scrambling backwards. I had to get out of there, but where to go? The truck was outside, but that creature was between me and the driver's door. Then it hit me, the roof hatch. I'd always laughed at those, just for emergencies, things, but damn, was this it? I didn't take time to think, just lunged for the ladder, heart pounding so loud I was afraid the creature would hear it. I hauled myself up, hands slick with sweat. Now, I ain't exactly a parkour expert, but desperation works wonders. I scrambled from the RV onto Elmer and Beatrice's roof and dropped down behind it, landing hard enough to make my knees complain. Elmer must have heard the commotion, because their door swung open just as I ducked behind a tree. His voice cracked through the night. Who's there? Hey! Beatrice, I think I heard. The rest was cut short by a strangled scream. Something crashed heavily against the side of the RV. I didn't stick around to see what. I bolted down the path toward the river, branches tearing at my clothes, my breaths coming in ragged sobs. That godawful snarl echoed behind me, getting closer. I splashed into the water, barely caring how cold it was. The river was wide, the far bank just a black smudge in the darkness. I had to get across. I have to. The water stung as icy fingers trying to drag me under. I had to get across. I just had to get. A roar shattered the night. It wasn't the same guttural growl from before. This was full of rage and, and triumph. I whirled around, half submerged, a scream bubbling in my throat. It stood on the far side of the RV bathed in the dim lights Elmer had left on. It held something in its clawed hands. All I could see was the flash of pale skin and then it tossed whatever it was towards the tree line. Beatrice. I forced the name out, a broken sob in the darkness. I couldn't think, couldn't process. All I knew was I had to get away. The creature was watching me, its eyes bright pinpricks in the gloom but it didn't move into the water. I splashed forward, fear mixing with the icy numbness seeping through me. My lungs burned, my muscles screamed, but I pushed on. Finally, my feet hit the opposite bank, and I pulled myself up, shivering violently. There was no time to hesitate. I turned and ran, stumbling through the undergrowth, branches whipping against me leaving a trail for the creature to follow. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the woods, its speed terrifying. I burst out of the trees onto a dirt track. For a dizzying moment, I couldn't figure out where the hell I was, but then it hit me, the main road. I wasn't far from the turnoff. If I could just get there, just flag down a passing car. Hope ignited in my chest and I took off running, sobbing with exertion. I didn't see the route. It tripped me, sent me sprawling. I hit the ground hard, my head spinning. When I managed to push myself up, the creature was there, looming above me, its breath hot and foul. Despair washed over me. This was it. I was gonna die out here in the middle of nowhere, torn apart by some nightmare from the bayou. But just as I thought it had lunge, the creature froze, its head cocked to one side, like it was listening to something. A car engine. Headlights flared in the distance, getting closer. Seizing this lifeline, I scrambled to my feet and screamed, waving my arms. Help! Please, help! The car got closer, its headlights blinding me. For one terrified second... I thought it might not stop, that it wouldn't see me in the darkness. Then it screeched to a halt, the driver's door slamming open. Hey, hey, what the hell? What's going? The driver began, a guy in his twenties maybe, 
but then he saw the creature outlined against the moonlit sky. His jaw dropped, words frozen. Go! I shrieked, stumbling forward. Just go! The guy seemed to snap out of his daze, and I heard the car door slam again. Tires spun on the gravel as he sped away. The creature let out an enraged bellow, starting towards the car, but it was too late. For a tense, endless moment, I thought it a chase after the car, but some animal cunning seemed to kick in. With a frustrated snarl, the creature turned back toward me. It advanced, slow and purposeful, and I backed up, my breath ragged in my throat. The end was here. Then, searchlights cut through the darkness. A bullhorn blared. This is the Sabine Parish Sheriff's Department. Put your hands where we can see them. The creature froze in mid-lunge, its head swinging wildly side to side. I didn't wait to see what happened next. I turned and ran as fast as I could down the road, the sound of shouts and gunshots echoing behind me. It felt like forever before they stopped. A deputy found me crouched by the side of the road, whimpering like some scared animal. The rest is a blur. The ambulance, the hospital, the questions. Turns out, the driver I flagged down hadn't gone far before calling the cops. They'd been searching the woods, on the lookout for what they thought was a poacher or a meth head gone feral. No one believes me when I tell them what I saw out there. Elmer and Beatrice aren't coming back. They found, well, let's just say they didn't find enough for a full burial. Me, they chalked me up to shock, survivor's guilt, maybe a drug habit I'm hiding. Whatever. Let them think what they want. I know what I saw. They never found the creature. Not alive, anyway. Hunters around the area started reporting strange tracks. Livestock turning up mutilated, real gruesome stuff. The old-timers down at the bait shop, they whispered that it was the grunch. Some swamp haint, a Cajun bogeyman story they scare kids with. They say it comes out at night, drawn by anger, by fear. Hunts those who stray too far from the herd. I don't know about all that. All I know is I ain't ever going back to the Sabine, and I ain't never going camping alone again. I've always said that Utah has some of the most otherworldly landscapes in the whole damn country. You get those red rock formations, the hoodoos, hell, even the salt flats out west near Wendover look like you've set foot on another planet. So maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise when things got weird during a solo camping trip last fall. My name's Killian, and I'm one of those RV guys. Got a nice setup, solar panels, the whole shebang. Means I can get off the beaten path. Really find those spots where it's just me and the wilderness. This time around, I decided to head down to Goblin Valley State Park. Never been. Photos looked incredible. First couple of days were pure bliss. Took my mountain bike out on some trails. Did some stargazing. You don't get skies like that back home near Salt Lake City. Figured I'd spend a few nights. Really soak it in. That's when it all kicked off. Night three, I'm sitting around the campfire, got a beer going, feeling pretty damn content with life. Out of nowhere, I catch this low growl. Deep as hell, coming from the shadows at the edge of the campsite. At first, chalked it up to a mountain lion or something. There around those parts. Thing was, I'd been careful. Food was all sealed up tight in the RV, no scraps, nothing to attract critters. This growl just kept going, over and over. Not the usual mountain lion sound, more throaty, almost rasping. My hairs stood on end. My dog, Rusty, a big old German shepherd, 
usually doesn't get spooked easy. Tonight, though, he was whining, hackles raised, tail tucked between his legs. Grabbed my flashlight, one of those heavy-duty ones, and shined it toward the sound. Caught nothing but darkness. The growling kept up, and now, swear to God, I heard something shifting in the scrub, like something big. Way too big to be a cougar. The sensible thing to do would have been to retreat to the RV, lock the doors, call it a night. But I'm also a stubborn son of a gun with enough testosterone to fill a damn rodeo, so of course I decided to investigate. Rusty stuck by my side, though he sounded more like he was about to pee himself than protect his dad. With every step into the darkness, that growl got louder, the rasping turning more guttural. Finally, caught a glimpse of something, two eyes reflecting back the flashlight beam. They weren't the usual glowing green of a predator. These were dull and yellow, way too far apart. Whatever this thing was, it was massive. Suddenly, the whole damn creature lunged into view. I choked back a scream. This thing was no animal I'd ever seen. Sure, it was on four legs, but that's as far as the resemblance to anything natural went. It stood about as tall as a horse, but with a body that was long and twisted, like it had too many joints in the wrong places. Skin looked smooth, hairless, and a sickly pale green color. The head, that's why the haunt my nightmares. Too big for its body, all sharp angles and lumpy bulges. It had a wide, gaping mouth hanging slack and filled with teeth like jagged shards of glass, dripping with this foul-smelling drool. It took one lumbering step towards me, and I bolted. Rusty barked and snarled, circling the creature, trying to distract it. Gave me the head start I needed to scramble back to the RV. Slamming the door shut, I could see Rusty through the window, still nipping at its heels. Then the beast turned, letting out a deafening roar that sent shivers down my spine. My poor dog didn't stand a chance. One swipe of those enormous claws, and it was over. Rusty went flying through the air, landing with a sickening thud. I watched in horror as the creature bent down and scooped him up in its jaws, bones crunching. Got into the driver's seat and fumbled for my keys, hands trembling so hard I could barely see straight. This thing was still coming for me. Slamming the gas pedal down, I tore out of there, tires spitting up gravel. Didn't even look back. Called the park rangers on my cell as I headed to the nearest town, voice ragged and barely able to get the words out. At first, they were skeptical, but after I described the creature, that skepticism quickly turned to concern. They launched a search party, but there was no sign of the beast or Rusty. The cops questioned me too, even the local fish and wildlife guys. Told them my story, straight as I'm telling it to you now. Some thought I was crazy, some thought I was drunk, and some, I think, believed me. But there was no proof, no body, no other witnesses. Life's a lot different now. I sold the RV, couldn't bear the thought of being in one again. Got a therapist, helps with the nightmares mostly. I avoid dark, isolated places like the plague, and every low growl or rustle in the bushes gets my blood running cold. Still haven't been back to Goblin Valley and I sure as hell don't think I will any time soon. They say some things are better left unseen, unknown. I'm starting to agree. But what stuck with me most isn't the horror of that night. It's what a ranger said to me after I'd calmed down enough to give a detailed description of that thing. Swears they get reports every so often from folks up in the high desert plateaus, ranches out on the edge of nowhere. Tales of a nightmarish creature, sightings going back decades, maybe even centuries. Part of local legend, they thought. Until that night, I guess.
I parked my RV on the edge of a clearing in Stanislaus National Forest. Perfect spot, far enough away from the main road. You know me, I love the seclusion. It was almost evening, and I decided to make some coffee. I pulled out the old camping percolator and a tin of grounds. Nothing like the smell of freshly brewed coffee out in the wilderness to chase away the chill. Hey, 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 is anyone there? A voice called out, a little too loud for my liking. Damn those kids, I muttered with a sigh. They're always out here, buzzing around like flies, probably looking to score some beer or something off some unsuspecting traveler. I didn't answer, hoping he'd get tired and just leave me alone. Hello? The voice again, and closer this time. A rustle in the bushes by the tree line and out from the shadows steps this guy, skinny jeans, scraggly beard. He kind of reminded me of someone, but I couldn't place it. Definitely looked like the type to bother a guy for a handout. Hey, man, I'm lost. His voice was kind of shaky, like he was spooked. I raised an eyebrow. This guy? Scared? Didn't quite add up. I've met all sorts out here, folks down on their luck, hikers who've taken a wrong turn, and none of them looked like they'd seen a ghost, not like this dude. Lost, huh? I said, putting the percolator down. Well, the main highway's a ways down, just follow this track. He cut me off. Look, man, I just, I need help. Like serious help. His eyes were darting about like he was looking over my shoulder. I frowned and turned my head to see what had him so jumpy. Nothing. Just a squirrel rustling in the leaves behind him. What kind of help you talking about exactly? I asked, starting to feel a little uneasy myself. Out here, it's good to be cautious. He wiped his face, and his hand came away smeared with dirt and... Blood? I don't know, he muttered. It's just, there's something out here. He waved towards the trees with a trembling hand. Something? I echoed. Like what, a bear, a cougar? Yeah, those were a real hazard out in these parts. But this guy looked well past being scared of a wild animal. And not like that. I don't know how to explain it. He stepped towards my RV and reached for the door handle. I froze, the hairs on my neck standing on end. Something in my gut was screaming at me, danger. Stay right there. I took a step back myself and reached under the driver's seat. Dude, just let me in. His voice went high-pitched and frantic. I gripped the handle of my point three eight. I'm not one to fire off at the first sign of trouble, but something felt terribly wrong. This guy and the whole situation, it just kept getting weirder and weirder. Look, buddy, I said, my voice steady and aiming the gun level at him. Back off. Slowly. I don't know what your deal is, but you're not coming near my RV. The guy's eyes widened, and he took a half step back but he didn't leave. That's when I saw it out of the corner of my eye, a flicker of movement in the trees, like a shadow that was too long, too fast. Christ, I whispered. The fear hit me like an ice bath. Please, please, it's getting closer, he pleaded. His whole body was shaking. The shadow zipped past again on the edge of the trees, and this time, I got a better look. It was tall, inhumanly tall. I couldn't make out its face, but I saw arms that were too long, ending in sharp claws. It moved in a blur, almost floating behind the trees. What the hell? I lowered my revolver slightly in confusion. The man seized a moment, lunged past me, and barreled into my RV, slamming the door closed behind him. What are you doing? I hissed. I heard him scrambling inside, rummaging through drawers. Just, it gets in everywhere.
He whimpered, his voice muffled by the RV door. His words sent a fresh chill down my spine. We both heard it, a low scratching sound coming from the roof of my RV. Get down! I yelled, but he wasn't listening. I caught a glimpse of his hand thrusting something out from the window, a flash of metal, a knife. He was waving it wildly in the air, his breath coming in ragged gasps. The scratching stopped abruptly, and the clearing fell eerily quiet. My heart hammered against my ribs. What the hell was that thing? And what was this guy doing with a kitchen knife? I waited, finger tense on the trigger of my gun. One long minute stretched into the next. It was so quiet I could hear my own pulse pounding in my ears. Then movement. I caught a glimpse of it hunched on the roof of the RV. In the dim twilight, its shape was grotesque and angular. I held my breath as I raised my gun, trying to steady my hand. The figure on the roof seemed to sense my movement. It shifted, its head twisting in an unnatural way as it looked toward me. I saw its eyes. They shone with a dull yellow light in the darkness, piercing me to the bone. I couldn't make out its mouth, but a low inhuman snarl rippled through the air. That snarl broke me. Instinct kicked in. I squeezed the trigger. The sound of the gunshot cracked through the silence, deafening and terrifying. The thing on the roof let out a shriek, a high-pitched, almost bird-like wail that sent shivers down my spine. That shriek was the last thing I heard before I went for the driver's door. I jumped in, slammed the gear shift into drive, and gunned the engine. I wasn't looking back. I wasn't going to give that thing. Whatever it was, a second chance. The man in my RV was screaming. Maybe he was right about me. Maybe I should have let him in. But it was too late now. The tires screeched against the dirt, kicking up a choking cloud of dust as I tore down the forest track. My hands were shaking so hard I could barely keep the RV on the road, and that panic screaming from the back wasn't helping. Shut up! I yelled, trying to drown out the man's hysterics and the blood-curdling screech echoing from the trees that was gradually fading into the distance. I fumbled for my phone in the glove compartment, hands trembling, but of course, no damn signal. Always like that out here. After several agonizing minutes, the trees thinned out, replaced by the welcome glow of gas station lights. I slammed on the brakes throwing the RV into park and leaping out. I ran towards the gas station, toward the promise of another living human, and pounded on the door. An old guy, probably the night shift worker, appeared on the other side, squinting against the harsh fluorescent lights. Help! Help, please! I gasped out, my voice ragged. He eyed me up and down and slowly unlocked the door. What the hell is it, middle of the night? That's when the screaming started again, from inside my RV. It was muffled, but it was loud enough to make the old guy jump. The guy in the back must have found one of the cabinets I kept locked for emergencies. The old guy and I whipped our heads around toward the RV in unison and his eyes widened with something like understanding. You bring one of those back here? he asked his accent thick and drawling. Then with a speed that belied his age, he reached under the counter and pulled out a shotgun. Stay right there, son. He crept towards the RV, gun raised. I followed behind, holding my breath, heart pounding in my throat. The man inside was still shrieking, but this time there were other sounds, scraping, thudding, and something wet-sounding I didn't even want to put a name to. The old guy peered through the RV's window and swore loudly. Holy mother of... Get back! He shouted, raising his shotgun and firing through the window. The sound of the shot made the screaming stop. The old guy fired again, 
and then a third time. He approached the driver's side and gestured for me to come closer. It didn't take much convincing. Inside the RV, it was a disaster. Blood sprayed across the walls and ceiling. Windows shattered. Torn upholstery littered the floor. The guy who'd forced his way in. He was nowhere to be seen. The old guy leaned closer and peered into the darkness. That ought to take care of the son of A. He was cut off by a sudden lunge from behind the seats. A long, clawed hand snaked around the old guy's neck and dragged him inside. I screamed. There was a flash of movement and a choked-off cry from the old guy, and then it was silent again. I didn't hesitate this time. I sprinted back into my truck, slammed it into reverse, and floored it. I tore back into the night, not caring where the road led me. I just needed to get away. The next morning I woke up in my RV, parked haphazardly on the side of the highway. I stumbled out, gasping for air, and looked around in a daze. It all came rushing back, the man, the creature in the woods, the old guy at the gas station. My phone rang. It was 911, probably a follow-up about the incident. I hesitated, but then answered. Hello? Mr. Uh, Mr. Anderson? We received a report of an incident at the... I cut them off. No. No incident. It was nothing. Just forget about it. And I hung up. I knew they wouldn't take kindly to that, and I knew sooner or later cops would come looking, asking questions. But there was no way I could explain. There was no way they'd believe me about the thing. Maybe they'd call me crazy, lock me up. I made a choice right then. I went back into the RV gathered my belongings, and took off again. I haven't stopped driving since. Every time I see a cop car, my palms sweat and my breath quickens. I keep to the back roads, avoiding towns and cities as best I can, always watching the tree line, always waiting for it to emerge. They say those things, the stick shifters, stick to the rural parts. People go missing out here all the time. I guess I'm just one more statistic now. Okay, so listen, maybe driving out to the middle of nowhere in Nevada for a week in the RV wasn't the smartest plan, especially after all those crazy stories about skinwalkers started doing the rounds online. But hey... Here's the thing about me. I'm stubborn. Name's Asher, by the way. Figured I needed to clear my head after that hole. Well, never mind that mess. Let's just say a guy needs some solitude and quiet after a bad breakup. So, I pack up my old man's RV, load up on snacks, the healthy kind, no junk food out here, and head off grid into the desert first couple of days, it's pure bliss. Stars like you wouldn't believe out here, man. The silence. No emails, no cell signal, no one calling me up with their stupid problems. Perfection. Then, well, things started to get a bit weird. Okay, a lot weird. Day three, I'm out hiking, just enjoying the rocks and the scrub brush, when I stumble across what looks like. I do know, a half-eaten rabbit carcass. Now weird, right? But way weirder was the fact that it was practically drained of blood. Like sucked dry. I started getting a bad feeling, so I hightail it back to the RV, feeling like something was watching me the whole way. Night falls. Should be peaceful, but I hear coyotes yipping and howling, getting way too close to my campsite. Then, I swear to you, I see a pair of eyes staring back at me from the darkness, way too high up to be a coyote. These eyes are big, and they glow in the moonlight. Like nothing normal. 
I figure I'm freaking myself out, but I grab my flashlight, throw on some boots, ready to scare whatever it is off. Nothing. I shine that beam out into the night, and there's nothing there. Whatever it was, it vanished. But I didn't sleep a wink that night, and when the first light hit, I started finding tracks around the RV. Big tracks, almost like a wolf, but with these long, claw-like marks in the dirt. It was like something out of a horror movie. Look, I'm not an idiot. I packed a rifle for emergencies, right? But you know what's even weirder than the tracks or those freaky glowing eyes? The silence. The coyotes stopped howling that night. Everything got deathly quiet. Like even the crickets were holding their breath. It was the quiet that finally convinced me something was truly messed up in this place. This morning I decided enough was enough, time to pack up and relocate. I didn't want to think about those big predator tracks right outside my door, the feeling that something with big, glowing eyes was stalking me. And especially not after I saw that the water jerrycans outside the RV had been tampered with. Someone or something had been messing with them, and the water inside smelled bad, like rot. I needed to get out, find some civilization, and rethink this whole solo vacation thing. Just then, I saw movement down by the tree line. My heart kicks into overdrive. A hunched figure, tall and skinny, slips between the scrubby trees. It was holding something in its hands, looked like a dead rabbit or some other animal. The thing was bone-thin, skin stretched tight over some weird, elongated skeleton. And those big, damn eyes? Yep, glowing right back at me, even in the morning light. I dive back in the RV, heart pounding so hard I think my ribs are going to crack. I slam the door, lock it tight, and fumble for the keys. I need to get out of here. I need to find someone, anyone. But as I turn the key in the ignition, the engine makes a pathetic sputtering sound and gives out. I try again and again. Dead. Someone sabotaged the engine. Someone or something. I hear a sharp crack and a thud on the roof, right above me. Then I hear something sliding down the side, like it's dragging long, sharp claws down the metal. The scraping on the roof starts up again, slow and heavy, like it's pacing. That's when I remember the emergency hatch on the roof. I grab a kitchen chair and scramble up onto the countertop. Sweat stings my eyes as I twist the latch, shove the hatch open, and haul myself through, slamming it shut behind me. From the roof of the RV, I get a good look at, at the thing. God, it's hideous. Like something from a nightmare. Its back is hunched, bones stick out beneath leathery skin, and its head is huge, skull too big for its starved-looking body. Those eyes burn even in the daylight, fixated on my RV like I'm the only thing on earth. I see its teeth now too, long and yellow, glistening in the sun. I remember the drained rabbit. Remember the water. Panic kicks in. It knows I'm trapped here. I have to do something. I spot a metal vent cover and pry it loose, adrenaline making me strong. I take a deep breath and smash the vent window on the driver's side. The sound echoes in the desert stillness. The creature snaps its head toward me, and I scramble away from the hatch. For a tense moment, nothing. Then it moves. My stomach drops as I see how fast it is, scrambling down the side of the RV in a flurry of limbs and claws. It's heading for the broken window, long fingers reaching inside. I snatch my rifle off the bed, ignoring my shaking hands as I flick off the safety. It lunges into the RV. I take aim and fire. The gunshot rings out, deafening in the enclosed space. The creature jolts backward with a shriek, a raw, inhuman sound. I fire again, 
and it howls in pain, dark blood splattering the RV interior. Then it's gone, scrambling back out and disappearing into the desert with shocking speed. Shaking, I reload. My ears ring from the shots fired. I need to go, drive now, engine or no engine. I scramble down into the driver's seat and curse as the key only sputters the engine uselessly. My only hope is to hotwire the thing, and please God, let my dad have taught me right. I hear a snap, the creak of the RV's roof flexing under inhuman weight. It's back. With trembling fingers, I work under the steering column, fumbling with wires. The creature slams against the windshield, cracking the glass, its glowing eyes inches from mine. Another slam and the side windows shatter, spraying glass over me. Its hands dart in, long fingers tipped with ragged claws, trying to grab at me. I shout, swatting wildly at them, desperation giving me strength. I feel a sharp pain in my arm as one of the claws catches me, raking across my skin. That's when the engine roars to life. I slam the RV into gear and floor it tearing away just as the creature throws itself bodily into the driver's side. I look back, hard in my throat, as the RV fishtails down the dirt road. The creature chases for a moment, but it's no match for even the old RV's speed. Soon, it shrinks to a speck in the distance. It doesn't follow. Hours later, I pull into a gas station, shaking and bleeding, but free. I tell the attendant about the animal attack, about needing a mechanic, the whole mess. I even let a doctor stitch up my arm. But I don't say the truth about those glowing eyes, that impossible speed, or the way it seemed to know what I was going to do before I did it. They find my RV a week later, half buried in the desert sands. The damage is bad, like a wild animal went crazy on it. No body, no sign of the creature. But there's something on the roof, scratched crudely into the paint, a single word. Trickster. I never learned what it meant. But I did some digging afterwards. Turns out, Native American legends around here, old stories from the Paiute and others, they talk about a skin-stealing trickster, a demon of the desert. That creature out there, Whatever it was, maybe those old stories are more than just legend after all. I've always been that guy, the outdoorsman in our crew. You know the type. Flannel shirts, a battered old camper van lovingly nicknamed Beatrice and far too many stories about bear encounters and close shaves with overly curious raccoons. I guess when you spend as much time around trees and critters as I do, you start to expect a bit of oddness. But let me tell ya, this last trip took the cake in the weirdness department. It started out harmless enough. Me, my buddy Caden, and our ever so slightly neurotic German shepherd, Sasha, decided to hit up the redwood forests of Humboldt State Park. I'd heard the woods there were something special, massive trees, moss hanging like curtains, the whole fairy tale gone wrong vibe. Honestly, I was half expecting to stumble upon a hidden gingerbread house or talking frog. The first day was great. Hiked a whole lot, found a few of the big boys, those redwoods make you feel like some kind of ant, and even managed to avoid Sasha getting too freaked out by the squirrels. By nightfall, we were set up at our campsite, the smell of hot dogs and campfire cutting through the crisp air. Dude, I swear I saw something back there, Caden muttered, his hot dog balanced precariously as he gestured vaguely towards the woods. I was getting firewood. It was big, man! Probably just a buck, I snorted. These forests were full of deer, no surprise there. 
Remember, they're more scared of you than you are of them. Yeah, well, I'm more scared of it than it is of me, Caden retorted, his mouth still full of hot dog. Typical. Night brought a deep quiet to the woods, broken only by Sasha's occasional low growl. That first night, it was easy to dismiss. She was always edgy at night, even at home, probably picking up a raccoon scent somewhere. Turns out, maybe Sasha knew more than we did. Day two, things started feeling wrong. The air hung heavy and still, like even the wind wasn't moving. We followed our maps, intending to reach Founder's Grove, where the really huge trees stood. Caden's eyes were constantly darting from side to side, like he expected to be ambushed. Relax, man, nothing's gonna jump out and eat ya. I joked, pushing through a thick clump of ferns. Sasha started barking, loud, agitated. See! Caden hissed. I told you there was something. The words cut off in his throat. From in front of us, a low, rasping growl sliced through the forest. It echoed off the trees, surrounding us in a way that made every hair on my body stand on end. It wasn't a deer. It wasn't a bear. It was wrong. Primal. I caught a flicker of motion, Caden screamed, and everything went chaotic. The thing was big, massive, its fur dark and shaggy. I didn't even know what it was, some nightmare hybrid of wolf and something else. I saw its teeth as it lunged straight for Caden, a flash of yellow against the darkness of its muzzle. Caden went flying, and for one horrible second I thought he was gone. But then Sasha shot past me, a low-furred bullet of teeth and protective rage. She hit the creature full on, snarling and snapping, and everything was noise and fur and chaos. Caden screamed again, somewhere to my left, scrambling back towards the trailhead. The creature staggered back, surprised for a moment by Sasha's attack. I didn't hesitate. Caden, run! My voice cracked as I fumbled for the pistol I kept tucked in my pack. He didn't have to be told twice. The second Sasha had the creature distracted, he bolted, crashing back the way we came. I took aim, my hand strangely steady despite the adrenaline pounding through me. I fired once, twice. The shots rang out deafeningly loud in the quiet woods. The creature yelped, a horrible sound. But Sasha was on him, forcing him backwards, her teeth finding purchase in its haunches. Sasha, come on! I yelled, but she was locked in, fighting tooth and nail. I saw the moment the creature broke. With a final agonized howl, it tore away from Sasha and shot off into the underbrush. I ran to Sasha's side, my heart in my throat. She was limping, blood slicking her side, but her eyes were bright as she whined and wagged her tail at me. God, girl! I choked out, burying my face in her fur for a moment. Relief and fear warred inside me. Caden stumbled out of the trees, his face white as a sheet. I barely had time to register him before I was barking orders. Grab the gear. We're getting out of here. I didn't look back as we hiked out, Sasha whimpering softly, my arm supporting her weight. I kept my senses on high alert, listening to even the slightest crack of a twig, expecting at any moment for it to come for us again. But the woods remained silent, save for Caden's harsh panting and Sasha's pain-filled whimpers. Just as we neared the parking lot, I heard a rustle somewhere off to our right. My hand immediately fumbled for my gun, ready to defend whatever was left of my crew. Instead, we found a park ranger staring at us in disbelief. We tried to explain, stumbling over each other with descriptions of the creature of the attack. The ranger, Ben, looked skeptical, but there was a flicker of concern in his eyes when he saw Sasha's wound. 
He radioed it in, asked us to stay put until further help arrived. Missing hikers, Ben muttered as he waited, his voice thoughtful. There have been a few recently. Couldn't figure out what could have taken them. Bears don't usually drag folks off, you know. I swallowed hard. What had we encountered back there? Was it behind those disappearances? And, just as importantly, was it still out there, watching us from the shadows? Help arrived more quickly than we expected. Two more rangers, armed to the teeth and looking grim, joined Ben. While they patched up Sasha and took our statements, my mind raced. What had we run into back there? Was it some kind of mutant bear, a wild dog gone feral, or something else entirely? The questions nagged at me, refusing to let go. While Sasha was loaded into a truck to be taken to the nearest vet, Caden and I piled into Ben's ranger vehicle. He promised to let us know about Sasha as soon as he could, but I could tell his mind was occupied with other things. Ben didn't drive us back to our campsite. Instead, we headed deeper into the park, toward the ranger station. I could barely focus on his apologies. My eyes kept scanning the trees, expecting the creature to burst forth again at any moment. When we reached the station, another surprise awaited us. It was bustling with activity, other rangers, a few cops, and even what looked like some folks from fish and wildlife. Well, damn, muttered Caden. I guess we weren't the only ones who saw something weird out there. The ranger station was small a few offices, a mess hall, and a whole lot of maps and radio equipment. We were ushered into a cramped room with two other guys who looked as shaken as we did. Mind telling us exactly what you encountered? One of the rangers, a woman with stern eyes and a no-nonsense haircut, leaned forward, a pen poised over a notepad. We retold it all again. The quiet of the woods, the growls, the attack, Sasha's bravery. The other two guys, turns out they were hikers, too, nodded grimly at the bits about the creature's description. When we finished, the room hung heavy with silence. Right, so, the woman started slowly. There's been sightings. Reports we dismissed as nervous campers or tall tales. But after you all describe something so similar, well, we can't ignore it anymore. Caden looked sick. What is that thing? He croaked. The woman hesitated, then finally spoke. Local legend passed down. Some Yurok tribal lore. They call it the Kokalawi. The name echoed strangely in the room, foreign and foreboding. It's not supposed to be real. One of the hikers chimed in, his voice barely above a whisper. It's a damn, what, a bogeyman, to scare kids into behaving. The ranger nodded. That's what we thought. But what you described, the size, the aggression, the fact that a bear or mountain lion wouldn't attack that way. She trailed off, none of us wanting to finish the thought. What now? I asked, dread settling in my stomach. We hunt it down. The ranger's voice was firm, resolute. We've got a team being prepped as we speak. We'll track that thing, tranquilize it, bring it in. We need to know what it is. We stayed at the station for hours. They took more statements, poured over maps, and Caden finally got news that Sasha would be okay. Exhaustion battled with the lingering adrenaline still coursing through me. It wasn't until well past midnight that we were finally allowed our own truck, instructed to drive straight home and not say a word to anyone. That drive back was a blur. Caden was silent, staring blankly ahead, and I doubt I said more than a few words. Sleep was impossible the next few days. I was jumpy, every creak of the floorboard setting off my nerves. News reports about missing hikers and increased ranger patrols flickered on the TV, 
a constant reminder of the darkness lurking out there. One morning, the phone rang. It was Ben. He sounded tired, but there was an undercurrent of excitement in his voice. They found it, he said simply. What did? I pressed, my knuckles turning white on the receiver. The Kokalawi, he answered, and my blood ran cold. They killed it. Relief and horror washed over me at the same time. I don't know exactly what I expected Ben to say next, maybe a scientific explanation, a rational breakdown of a new, undiscovered species. Instead, what he described was something out of nightmare. A massive, twisted canine, covered in matted black fur, sharp teeth, and eyes faintly glowing like embers. The lab guys will have their hands full with that one. He chuckled darkly. Never seen anything like it. There was a news report a few days later. A freak incident, they said. Malformed bear, driven mad by rabies. They buried the story quickly, just another strange wilderness occurrence swept under the rug. Caden and I never spoke of it again. We both pretend it was a bear, I suppose. Easier that way. But sometimes, when I'm out in the woods, the air feels too still, the silence too heavy, and I imagine it watching me from the shadows. The Kokalawi just a legend? I hope to God that I'll never find out for sure. Look, I'm Ezra, an outdoors type. Spent most of my life hitting trails and boondocking, so you could say I'm no stranger to remote locations. Thing is, this latest spot, it's got me spooked. I'm parked smack in the middle of the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. Gorgeous, sure, but something's been off ever since I got here last week. First, it was the missing campers. Ranger at the welcome station mentioned two guys who vanished without a trace a few days back. Now, folks going missing in the woods isn't unheard of, but then the weirdness really started ramping up. At night, I kept hearing this screeching, gave me goosebumps every time. Like claws scraping on metal but deeper, raspier. Told myself it was an owl or something. Then yesterday... Hiking on the North Country Trail, I swore I saw something moving in the trees just out of sight. Whatever it was, it was big and fast. No way it was any critter I recognize. I should have hightailed it back to my RV, Gertrude, but nope, I kept on like a dummy. Found something that made my blood run cold. It was a half-eaten deer carcass, but not like a coyote or mountain lion would leave it. The thing was torn to shreds, bones cracked open. I got out of there as quiet as I could, my heart pounding. Maybe I'm paranoid, but those missing guys kept creeping into my head. That night, I doubled down on security. Deadbolt Gertrude's door, drew the curtains on every window. I even grabbed my point three eight just in case. Never thought I'd need it outside of target practice. I tossed and turned, that damn screeching keeping me awake. Must have only dozed off for an hour or two when a sound jerked me upright. Thump. Thump. Right outside Gertrude's window. I froze. Adrenaline kicked in, and I eased out of bed, gun clutched in my hand. I inched toward the window and peered through a tiny gap in the curtains. That's when I saw it. The thing was hunched right by the window, its back to me. My first thought was, bear, but then I got a good look at the shape of it and knew I was way off. This thing was lean, all sinew and bone, with limbs too long and angular to be natural. It was moving its head, sniffing, then it whipped around. The moonlight caught its face, and I swear, I'm not making this up. Its skin was almost translucent, stretched tight over its skull. 
But it was the eyes that got me. Pupils huge, ringed by a sickly green glow, reflecting back at me from the darkness. It let out a hissing snarl and slammed a clawed hand against the glass. I stumbled back, guns slipping from my fingers. The thing outside screeched again, that horrible, nails on chalkboard noise. Then it started clawing at the door, trying to force it open. I snapped out of my daze. Scrambling over, I slammed my shoulder against the door, forcing it shut, and hit the deadbolt. The screeching ramped up into a frenzy, the door rattling with every impact. Come on, come on, I muttered, fumbling around on the floor for my gun. The creature shrieked again, and I heard a wet thud, something smearing against the window. I didn't look. Just grabbed the gun and backed away, heart thundering in my chest. I waited, weapon raised, but the attack never came. After what felt like an eternity of petrified silence, I dared to peek out the window again. My stomach turned. Whatever it was, it had painted a long streak on the glass, thick and reddish-brown. Blood. I knew then it didn't matter who or what was out there. It knew I was in here, and it wouldn't quit until it got in. I grabbed my keys and ducked into the driver's seat. One twist and the engine roared to life, headlights cutting through the darkness. I slammed Gertrude into gear and hit the gas. The engine roared, and Gertrude lunged forward. Gravel sprayed from the tires as I tore down the road, the trees blurring past me. Headlights cut through the darkness, but behind me, all I saw was the impenetrable blackness of the forest. My mind raced. Where do you go when something like that is chasing you? Cops wouldn't believe a word of this, and even if they did, what could they do against whatever the hell was out there? No, the only option was to drive. Keep driving till I hit civilization. I glanced at the fuel gauge, nearly full. That was something, at least. My phone buzzed on the dashboard. A text from my sister. Asterisk, hey, haven't heard from you. Everything okay? Asterisk, I couldn't tell her. Not about the creature, not about the missing hikers. She'd freak out, would probably drop everything and try to come get me. I texted back a shaky lie. Trucks acting up. Gonna find a mechanic tomorrow. Love you? Tears welled up in my eyes. I blinked them back furiously. Self-pity wouldn't help right now. Survival would. I checked the rearview mirror every few seconds, my heart skipping a beat each time, expecting to see glowing eyes and a distorted silhouette bursting from the tree lean but the road stayed empty. After what felt like forever, the trees began to thin out. Relief washed over me when I saw the flickering lights of a roadside diner up ahead. Headlights swept across the parking lot as a semi pulled out, and I seized the opportunity, swerving Gertrude in behind it. Slamming the gear shift into park, I left the engine running and fumbled with the door handle. I stumbled toward the diner's entrance, legs shaky from adrenaline. Just as I reached the door, headlights flared behind me. My body tensed, ready to run again. It was just a beat-up old pickup. A couple of guys, probably locals, climbed out, laughing. They shot me a curious glance but thankfully paid me no mind. I pushed through the diner door and scanned the tables half full of weary-eyed truckers and late-night eaters. I slid into a booth in the corner. A waitress with a kind smile and a faded name tag that read May ambled over. What can I get for you, Han? I barely hesitated. Coffee. Black. And the biggest, greasiest burger you've got. She chuckled. Sounds like you've had a night. Coming right up. Food wouldn't solve my problems, but it would buy me time. I pulled out my phone, 
fingers trembling as I dialed the number I knew by heart. Hello? My dad's groggy voice answered. Dad, it's Ezra. I need your help. And then I told him everything. The noises, the creature, the smear of blood on Gertrude's window. To my relief, he didn't question my sanity. Just listened, and when I was done, spoke in a calm, steady voice. Okay, son, here's what you do. An hour and one truly disgusting burger later, my dad pulled into the parking lot in his ancient Chevy truck. He hopped out, a duffel bag slung over his shoulder. I'd never been so glad to see him in my life. I threw my arms around him in a tight hug. He was all warm flannel and the faint smell of sawdust, the same scent that's clung to him ever since I was a kid. You all right, son? His face was creased with worry. I nodded, then filled him in on what happened after I had left the forest. When I was done, his mouth tightened into a grim line. Let's not waste time. He walked to the back of his truck, opened it up, and then I saw it, his old hunting rifle. I blinked, then a wave of hope surged through me. Maybe this nightmare could finally end. While Dad loaded up, May came out carrying a steaming mug. Refill, Han? No, thanks, I said, pushing the untouched burger away from me. We're heading out. She saw the rifle then, and her eyes widened. You fellas be careful out there. Dad tossed her a twenty. Thanks, May. We will. We didn't talk much on the way back into the forest. When we reached the spot where I'd parked Gertrude, the RV was still there, bathed in the moonlight. Cautiously, we approached. Whatever that thing was, it seemed to have vanished. Relief welled up, but Dad held up a hand, silencing me before I could speak. He surveyed the ground, tire marks, the smear of blood on the window, all the evidence of my close escape. Then he walked around the RV, rifle raised, checking for any sign of our unwelcome visitor. Finally, he turned to me and nodded. With trembling hands, I helped him load Gertrude onto the back of his truck. This place was tainted now. Once we secured it with straps, Dad gestured toward his old Chevy. Get in, Ezra. Time to go. I know a place we can lay low for a while. And so, with the headlights cutting into the woods, we left. I glanced back at the hulking shadow of Gertrude as it grew smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. Part of me wondered if we were making a colossal mistake, driving right back into the belly of the beast. But mostly, I just felt a bone-deep weariness, and below it all, a flicker of something like defiance. Whatever that creature was, whatever those locals up north called it, a high behind, a rake, something else entirely, it wouldn't win. I got carried away last year when I decided to ditch my cushy little apartment in downtown Denver and buy myself a refurbished RV. It felt like a midlife crisis cliché, but hey, sometimes you gotta shake things up, right? And let's be real, the idea of traveling cross-country, no schedules, no rent, it had a certain allure. My name's Wyatt, by the way. Fast forward a few months and a few thousand miles. Here I am, setting up camp for the night in Joshua Tree National Park. Talk about a change of scenery from my old urban digs. This place feels like another planet. I've been hiking most of the day, and I'm starving, which is probably why I'm burning half the sausages and barely cooking the potatoes I have going over the campfire. You know, if you stopped staring at your phone you wouldn't be running dinner. A voice startles me from the darkness beyond the flickering firelight. It's a woman's voice, a little bit husky, a little bit amused. I nearly dropped the spatula, 
whirling around to scan the encroaching shadows for the source of the voice. Anyone there? I call out. Who said that? Silence. Maybe a hiker who passed by and thought I was being a total camping novice. Probably accurate. My shoulders relax a little, and a sheepish laugh escapes my lips. Guess it's just me out here, then. I mutter, poking at the blackened sausages. Just as I'm about to give up and eat whatever charcoal-like concoction I've created, a pair of sneakers emerges into the firelight. Old, dirty converse. A pair of faded jeans follows, and finally, the torso of a woman wearing a worn flannel shirt. She takes a seat on a rock a little beyond the dancing flames, her back half turned to me. You don't exactly blend in, she says, her head bent as she fiddles with something just out of sight. Well, sorry. Not all of us can be expert survivalists, I say more defensively than I intended. I take a closer look her hands are huge for a woman, callous and rough-looking, a stark contrast to the flannel-clad body they seem mismatched with. Now that she's closer, something about her seems off. What's your name? I ask hesitantly. She's silent for a beat or two, then finally turns slightly towards me, her face still just out of the firelight. I think you're going to find the answer to that a little disappointing, she rasps. Now my spine is tingling, and a prickle of very real unease has replaced my embarrassment. This isn't a casual camper passing through. This is something else entirely. Her voice alone carries an undertone of something wrong, something unnatural. Is everything okay? I ask, trying to find some level ground trying to not let fear creep into my voice. You need some water or anything? She moves then, finally turning her face fully into the firelight. It's a face I won't be able to scrub from my nightmares. A face pulled too long, features too narrow, eyes that seem to swallow any nearby light. Its skin has a strange, translucent quality. I can make out the rough outline of her skull just beneath. For a split second, a flicker of something reptilian passes over it, and a strangled gasp tears from my throat. She grins then, and the teeth that flash in the firelight are too long, too numerous, too sharp. The woman, or whatever it is, lunges forward with an impossible speed, knocking me backwards off my feet. I see a flash of a hand, too big, too strong ending in vicious claws raking the air inches from my face. I scramble backwards, my mind a useless riot of terror. The campfire, that's my only hope. I kick out wildly, managing to catch the edge of an overturned log, sending it rolling end over end into the flames. Sparks shower us both, but the creature barely flinches, only hissing in annoyance. My fumbling fingers find the lighter in my pocket, flick it clumsily. Come on, come on. Fire flares, catching the dry wood, bathing us both in a sudden flare of orange light. The creature lets out a piercing screech, a sound that cuts through me more than any physical blow. And then, almost impossibly, it retreats, melting backwards into the darkness with shocking speed. My heart thuds like a drum against my ribs. Scrambling to my feet, I barely have a second to register what's going on before a searing pain jolts through my arm. I look down to see my flannel sleeve torn to shreds, and three deep gashes welling with blood beneath. I clutch the wound and sprint toward my RV, terror fueling every frantic step. Fumbling the keys from my pocket, I unlock the door and slam inside, slamming the lock shut behind me. My breaths rasp harshly in the sudden silence. That, that wasn't an animal. No animal moves that fast, looks like that, sounds like that. I'm bleeding, the pain in my arm sharp and unrelenting. 
I fumbled through the first aid kit with trembling hands, muttering half-formed plans under my breath. I need to leave. I need to drive, find a hospital, a ranger station, anyone. Someone has to believe me. Someone has to. I hear a scrape against the metal, a muffled snarl right outside the RV. I freeze, eyes locked on the window. It's peering in, those eerie eyes reflecting back the dashboard lights. Slowly, deliberately, it raises one massive clawed hand and presses it to the glass, leaving a bloody smear in its wake. The creature circles my RV like a starved shark, its clawed hand scraping along the metal, a grating symphony of terror filling the tiny space. My breathing is a frantic stutter, and sweat trickles down my face, the sharp tang of fear thick in my throat. It can't get in, right? But then I remember that monstrous strength, the way it sent me sprawling with the merest swipe of its hand. Logic is abandoned, replaced by a blind, animal instinct to survive. I have to do something. I have to get out of here. My eyes search frantically, landing on the keys still dangling from the ignition. Maybe I can outrun it. Maybe. My wounded arm throbs in protest, every tremor sending spikes of pain through my body. No time to think about it. Grimacing, I rip a strip from my shirt and wrap it haphazardly around the gashes to stem the bleeding. Deep breath, focus. There's a gun under the seat. My hands tremble as I reach for it, the cold metal a brief reassurance against the rising terror. Slowly, I inch the driver's side door open just enough to slip out, keeping my body low, my eyes locked on the creature. It's crouched directly behind the RV now, its narrow head darting back and forth, seemingly confused by my disappearance. Now, I burst out, sprinting towards the front of the RV, my footsteps loud on the rocky ground. For a split second, the creature seems stunned. Then, with an ear-splitting shriek, it charges after me, its form a blur in the darkness. I can feel its breath hot on my heels, hear the rasp of its claws scrabbling against the earth. I fling myself over the hood of the RV, and for one desperate moment, it's gone from sight. But it knows I'm here. I hear it snuffling near the rear wheel, smell the feral musk of it. I slam the gun into the chamber, spinning around just in time to see the beast launch itself towards me. I fire once, twice, and the shots explode in the night air. It hisses, staggering, and I fire again. It's closer now, too close. I squeeze my eyes shut for a split second, anticipating the impact, the slash of claws, but the blow never comes. Silence, except for my ragged breaths, slowly filtering back into the quiet desert night. I open my eyes cautiously, and there it is, splayed on the ground near feet away, its eerie eyes fixed in an unending stare. Dead. Shakily, I lower the gun, my knees threaten to buckle. I did it. I killed it. It seems impossible. I look down at the creature's body its skin has toughened to a mottled gray, and in the pale moonlight, I see a network of thick scales covering its body. My stomach churns. I have to leave, have to call someone, report this. And I need a freaking hospital. My arm is pounding in time with my racing heart. But there's something else, a nagging itch at the back of my mind. I crouch down, my hand hovering over the creature's elongated skull. It's something ancient, something that shouldn't be, yet the locals must know of it. There must be stories, whispers in the shadows. I think back to the hiker, the way she turned in disgust at my phone the almost pitying way she said. I think you're going to find the answer to that a little disappointing. Disappointing. As if she knew, as if everyone who'd lived on the edges of this desert wilderness knew. 
Maybe I haven't killed the only one. Maybe. A twig snaps in the darkness, and I jump, whirling around, gun raised. It's just a rabbit, frozen in the headlights. But the fear it ignites is as sharp as anything the creature had done. This place holds secrets, dark secrets woven into the ancient rock and sand. Maybe tomorrow I'll try to find answers. Tonight, I just need to get to a place where there are streetlights and crowds of people, to bury this feeling of eyes in the darkness. Because I think maybe it was right. This place, it has a name for things like this. A skin changer. I parked my RV on the wide, dirt shoulder just outside the boundary of Sequoia National Forest. It was my first time here, and man, those trees were something else. I'm no nature freak, but even I was awestruck by their size. I figured this was far enough away to avoid the campsite crowds, but still close enough to enjoy the views. My name is Ryland, by the way. I spent that first day setting up camp and enjoying the late afternoon sun. Hiked a short trail near my site, took some cheesy photos by a towering redwood, ate some hot dogs, and called it a night. Woke up early, grabbed some coffee, and set off for a proper hike. I had a specific trail in mind, the Circle Meta Loop, I think they called it. Seemed like a decent length and the elevation wasn't too crazy. Now, the hike was nice enough, plenty of the typical California forest stuff, tall trees, some streams, you know the drill. But around the halfway point, something just felt off. It was one of those subtle shifts in the atmosphere you can't quite explain. It's like when you first walk into a room and realize everyone's already staring at you. I brushed it off at first, attributing it to my overactive imagination. Told myself, Hey Ryland, you spend too much time in that tin can of an RV. But the nagging feeling stuck with me. Birds went quiet. Like dead silent. Even the bugs seemed to vanish. Suddenly, I heard what sounded like a loud snap. I froze, scanning my surroundings. Nothing. But the snap wasn't just a random noise, it felt calculated. Like something heavy snapping a thick branch underfoot, just to see if you'd react. I started walking faster, doing my best to play it cool while my insides nodded up. My senses were on high alert, trying to pinpoint the source of the noise. And that's when I saw it. Well, at least part of it. Between two dense trees, just a few paces from the trail, I caught a glimpse of something thick and dark. I strained to focus, but with the shadows and foliage, I couldn't make out a clear shape. The thing, whatever it was, didn't move. It felt wrong, like it didn't belong in this forest. My first instinct was to bail, turn around and sprint the other way. But fear can make you do stupid things, and mine manifested as a burning curiosity. I needed to get a better look. I took a slow step forward, trying not to make a sound. Then another. And another. The closer I got, the more my heart hammered against my ribcage. I was sweating through my shirt. I was practically holding my breath as it slowly came into full view. My stomach lurched and a gasp escaped my throat. It was a creature. But it didn't resemble anything I'd ever seen before. It was tall, too tall for a bear, with impossibly long, slender limbs. It was hunched over, probably eight feet tall even with its curved back. Thick, matted fur covered its body, almost black with streaks of gray. Its head, that was the worst part. Long and narrow, it ended in a snout that was disproportionately large for its skull. It lifted its head slightly, 
and I saw them. Not regular eyes, nothing with whites or pupils. Just two oval shapes reflecting the sunlight back at me with an almost oily sheen. Now, I'm not a small guy. But whatever this thing was, it dwarfed me. My fight-or-flight response was going haywire. I didn't know if it wanted to eat me, play with me, or turn me into some weird woodland ornament. But deep down, I felt an animalistic terror. I bolted. I turned and ran as fast as my legs could carry me back down the trail. Branches whipped against my skin, but I didn't even notice. I could hear it lumbering after me, the pounding of its massive limbs against the earth growing louder. It was gaining ground. Fear made my vision tunnel, and my legs burned. I knew I wasn't gonna outrun it. I started zigzagging through the trees, desperately searching for something, anything that could give me an advantage. Just as I thought the creature was about to snatch me up, I spotted my salvation, a dry riverbed with a steep incline. I scrambled down, nearly slipping on the loose gravel. When I dared to look back, I saw it peering down the slope, those awful eyes calculating. Its body seemed too unwieldy to descend safely. I was, for the moment, safe. But panic still clawed at me. I stumbled downstream, slipping and sliding, not even sure where I was heading. I needed distance, needed to find a road or a ranger station. All the while, I could feel those eyes boring into my back. I finally burst through a clearing and, to my relief, stumbled upon a narrow dirt road. It was deserted, but a road was better than nothing. I scanned the tree line expecting the creature to emerge at any moment. Yet there was nothing. Silence. I took a deep breath to regain some composure. And that's when the screaming began. It came from up the road, from the direction of my campsite. Bloodcurdling, a woman's voice filled with terror and pain. The fear hit me full force again and my body was on autopilot before my brain caught up. I sprinted toward the scream, not even thinking about the creature anymore. Someone was in danger. I reached my campsite, and what I saw made my blood freeze. A couple who must have been camping nearby. The woman, there was so much blood, and the man was kneeling beside her, desperately trying to cover a gash on her side. Her eyes were wide with a panic that mirrored my own. That monstrous creature stood over them, blood dripping from its elongated snout. A low snarl came from deep within its chest. The man saw me and shouted, Run! Go! My survival instincts battled with a gut-wrenching need to help. It felt like hours passed, when in reality it was probably only seconds. Then... The creature turned its head slightly. Those eerie eyes locked on me. My feet moved without my conscious command. I charged toward the creature, not to fight, but to distract. It turned towards me, surprise briefly flashing across those oily eyes. The man seized the moment, dragging the woman as far from the carnage as he could. The creature didn't immediately follow. It stood watching me, as if trying to decide whether I was worth the change in menu. Then, with a deep guttural sound, it lowered its head and rushed at me. I sidestepped at the last second, the force of its lunge nearly pulling me off balance. I scrambled to put some distance between us, glancing back to check on the couple. They had reached the edge of the clearing. I yelled to them, Don't stop! Get to the road, find help. I had no plan, just adrenaline and desperate instinct. I grabbed one of the discarded hiking poles and wielded it like a baseball bat. The creature circled me, its eyes never leaving mine. When it lunged again, I managed to score a hit across its snout. It snarled and recoiled, shaking its head. The respite was fleeting. 
This time it didn't hesitate, closing the gap in two massive strides. I swung wildly, the pole snapping on impact with its forearm. I flung myself backwards and rolled away, the hot stink of its breath burning my senses. My eyes darted around. There was a sturdy-looking fallen tree nearby. If I could reach it, maybe I could climb out of reach by myself some time. I lurched towards it, legs pumping. The creature was gaining on me. Another ten steps, five. Then, a gunshot rang out. The creature stumbled, letting out a deafening roar that reverberated through the forest. Another shot, and it staggered before turning to flee. It looked almost clumsy in its retreat, crashing through the trees with surprising speed. I slumped against the down log, gasping for air. The couple emerged from the bushes, the man clutching a rifle in trembling hands. We saw your RV, he said, voice shaking. I keep a gun, just in case. We stayed rooted in that spot until park rangers arrived. They secured the area, and a flurry of questions followed. My descriptions of the creature were met with bewildered looks and thinly veiled disbelief. Search teams scoured the woods, but found no trace of the animal. The aftermath was a nightmare mix of paperwork, police interviews, and the crushing weight of survivors' guilt. The couple didn't make it. By the time help reached them, it was too late. Every news outlet picked up the story. Mystery creature attacks campers, they screamed. Conspiracy theorists and online detectives filled comment sections with wild speculation. Some labeled me a hoaxer, others a hero. They eventually ruled the deaths as an animal attack. Most likely a bear, they said, though they never found any evidence. The case closed, the files gathering dust in some forgotten cabinet. But I knew. I'd seen it, smelled it. The park reopened. Life moved on for everyone else, except for me. No matter where I went, that forest followed. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, hearing the snap of branches, the guttural snarl that haunted my nightmares. It's with me even now, an unwelcome shadow that lingers at the edge of my vision. Some nights, driven by a morbid curiosity— I scoured the online forums dedicated to cryptids and strange beasts. I look at grainy photos and outlandish theories about creatures lurking in the shadows. Then I see the artist's renderings, depictions based on my shaky descriptions, and a chill runs down my spine. It's never quite right. But it's close enough. The local legends grow. They call it the Wraith of the sequoias, a shapeless terror whispered around campfires. A cautionary tale spun to spook hikers and keep them alert in the wilds of California. They don't know how right they are. I wake up to the RV bumping around. It feels like we hit a pothole, but we're parked, which is weird. Must have been a nightmare or something. Man, I hate those. I'm way out in Sequoia National Forest, California. Been off-grid for the past. I checked my watch, four days now. Time gets funny when the only faces you see are trees. Kinda why I love it. I'm not gonna lie. I need the isolation sometimes. Life in this city's a constant rat race. My name's Theo, by the way. I sit up and yawn, sunlight poking through the windows. I look around, and huh, the whole RV seems off. Tilted somehow. I swear my rig was level when I parked it. Maybe I didn't notice last night, was too tired. Whatever, it's still early. I'll adjust it later. My stomach growls. Guess it's time to break out the pancake mix. I get up, stretch. Hear a rustling outside by the door. 
Figure it's a squirrel or chipmunk after my stash. Happens all the time. I grin. All right, you little bandits, come get your... I cut myself off as I walk by the window on my way to the pantry. I see. Okay, hold on. There's something out there, something big. And I know for a fact ain't no grizzly bears around here. I get a better look. First, the hands, if you can even call them that. They're huge, bigger than mine, gnarly, with claws like a freaking badger. This thing, whatever it is, is leaning against the RV, and it towers over me. I count four of those clawed fingers on each hand. Its body is hunched over, for covering it except for its chest. It's kinda hard to make out. The fur is a weird muddy brown, clumped together. It doesn't have a neck. Its head sits directly on its massive shoulders, and man, the shape of that head is off. There's almost a snout there, blunt but wide. Eyes way low on the face, beady black little things. Its whole body is twitching, like it's about to pounce. I back away from the window, heart thumping so loud I'm afraid it can hear me. What the hell is that thing? Okay, okay. Theo, stay calm. I grab my old man's rifle from under the bed. I check the ammo, just in case. Yep, full chamber. It's go time. I know it's crazy. I know I'm alone, miles from any help. But this thing, it's on my turf and it's freaking me out. I ease myself to the door, take a deep breath and count to three. Then I yank the door open and scream. Get the hell out of here! I level my rifle straight at it. The creature doesn't even flinch. It straightens up. Now it's taller than the door frame, easy seven feet at least, and makes this gurgling noise deep in its throat. The sound chills me to the bone. I fire off a warning shot into the air. Back off! Thing does. Takes one lumbering step, then another. Still hunched over, but getting some distance. My hands are shaking, but I keep the gun trained on it as it disappears into the trees. I watch, frozen, heart pounding in my ears. I can't believe what I just saw. But there's no mistaking that thing. It ain't natural. Long minutes pass. The only sounds are the birds and the rustling leaves. I finally lower the rifle, legs weak. I look at the spot where the the whatever it was, disappeared. I shut the RV door. My hand brushes against the panel and it feels... dented? No way. I go back outside, walk around to the spot where it was leaning. Oh man, there they are. Huge dents in the metal, deep gashes from those claws. That thing, it could have ripped straight through if it wanted to. Why didn't it? I don't have time to think. Gotta make a move. I run back into the RV, started up, hands trembling on the steering wheel. I pull out of the campsite, bouncing hard down the dirt track. I ain't looking back. I drive for what feels like hours, until the dirt road finally joins a proper highway. My grip on the wheel is white-knuckled, but the adrenaline's starting to fade replaced by a bone-deep chill. What the hell just happened? I pull over at a gas station. First one I've seen since I drove up into the forest. Gotta refuel, figure out where the hell I even am. This ain't familiar territory. I get out, legs wobbly. I try to stretch, but my whole body aches. Gotta get a hold of myself, figure out my next move can't be driving around in the middle of nowhere with, with that thing out there. First priority, find a ranger station, tell them what I saw. Then I check the map, nearest town is almost twenty miles back the way I came. There has to be a quicker route. I go inside the gas station. It's small, 
one of those rundown places with the flickering lights and a dusty cooler in the corner. The only other person is a kid at the register, skinny dude in a faded baseball cap, engrossed in his phone. Hey! I raise my voice. He glances up, eyes dull, and mumbles. Yeah? Need directions to the nearest town. I try to sound friendly, but my voice is strained. He snickers. Town? You're kidding, right? Nearest one's a good half hour away. I frown. What about those back roads, fire trails, anything? The kid shrugs. Nah, they all wind up back in the park. He looks back at his phone. I bite back a curse. I gotta get out of here. Listen, I say, urgency in my voice. I know this sounds crazy, but there's something out there, something dangerous. I need... He cuts me off, scoffing. Dude, I barely know what county I'm in half the time. Take the highway. It's your only shot. I want to argue... But what's the point? This guy is tuned out, doesn't care. I turn to leave, and then I spot it, tacked to a corkboard behind the counter. An old missing person's poster. It's faded, but the face is familiar. A hiker. It even says, Last seen, Sequoia National Forest. There's a faded date, about two weeks ago. My blood runs cold. There's more than one of those things out here. I glance up at the kid behind the counter, still scrolling on his phone. I should warn him, but, nah, he'll write me off as a lunatic. Best to get moving. I walk out, climb back into the RV, heart pounding. As I pull onto the highway, I keep glancing back at the gas station half expecting to see that creature tearing out of the woods. I drive, and drive, and drive some more. Gotta get as far away from the forest as possible. After a couple of hours, I find a small, mostly deserted campground. Figure it's safer than being alone, but I park right on the edge by the exit, just in case. Dusk settles in and the shadows grow long. I sit in my RV, staring out at the woods, rifle loaded on my lap. Every rustle, every snapping twig makes me jump. My nerves are completely shot. Then I see it, a dark shape lumbering in the distance. My heart leaps into my throat. It's massive, hulking, just like the one I encountered before. I freeze. It walks into the light of a nearby campfire illuminating its features. I realize, with a wave of relief, that it's just a bear. A big bear, but nothing like that, that thing I saw. I exhale slowly, trying to calm myself. What the hell is wrong with me? Jumping at shadows now? I need sleep. Desperately. The next morning, I drive to the nearest town. First thing, hit up the library, use their internet. I search for missing persons reports in and around the forest. There are a lot. Disappearances in national parks aren't uncommon. I know that, but seeing the sheer number is chilling. There's one in particular that catches my eye. Guy named Jacob, early thirties, avid hiker. Went missing a month ago. They never found him. I start digging into old local legends, internet forums, even those cheesy campfire stories sites. Finally, I stumble across something. An isolated incident, reported by some hikers a few years back in the same area I was in. They claimed to see a large, monstrous creature bipedal, covered in fur. Described hands with long claws, just like what I saw. They weren't taken seriously, of course. It got chalked up to a mountain lion sighting, maybe even a bear attack. But I know better now. There's a name associated with the story, a Native American term the hikers heard some locals throwing around, the Nalissa Philea. 
The legend describes it as a dark spirit, shapeshifter, trickster of the forest. A trickster that fits. Playing with its prey, testing me. The thing could have ripped my RV apart if it wanted to. That dent in the metal, the scratches, it was showing me what it could do. I leave the library feeling sick. It's real. This Nalissophilia, whatever it is, is real. I don't know how, don't even want to think about it, but I have to accept it. And it's out there. Which means I gotta do something. I owe it to Jacob, to all those missing people. Over the next few days, I get to work. I talk to rangers, pretending I saw a bear that acted weird. I convince one of them to come back to my campsite to see the dents the creature left. They shake their heads, but they promise to put out an alert. Not much, but it's something. I buy supplies, gear. I know I can't face this thing alone, but I can exactly stroll into the police station and tell them there's a mythical monster running around, either. Gotta find someone who believes. My gut tells me it's gonna come back, back to me. The Nalissa Philea. It ain't done messing with me yet. Weeks turn into a month. No sign of the creature. The ranger patrols peter out. The warnings get taken down. Life tries to go back to normal. But for me, it can't. I can't sleep at night without checking every noise outside my window. Every trip to the grocery store... I'm scanning the faces, bracing myself for that familiar chill of recognition. This has taken over my life. It's all I can think about. I keep coming back to the idea that there's someone else out there who could help. Maybe a hunter, a survivalist, someone who lives on the fringes, someone who might see the world the way I do now. So I quit my job, sell off most of my stuff, and upgrade the RV. Time to become a nomad, a hunter myself. I won't stop until I find that thing, until I end it. I'll do it for Jacob, and all the others who vanished into that forest. And hey, maybe a little bit for myself, too. <laughs>